Welcome back. We're going to be exploring um, another one of my threads from Twitter. And uh, this one I'm excited to do. I've got Ryan with me too to kind of jump in and ask questions or stop me if I get a little out of line or my tangents go too crazy. Um, but yeah. It's so, good to be here. Thank you for being here, Ryan. So if you do go to my profile on Twitter, uh, my pinned tweet is this one right here. It's got a link to my music. And then underneath it, I've got indices or different indexes that hold a lot of different threads of value that I have written uh, over the past couple years, uh, trying to explain some of my paradigm and uh, my music as well. So you go to this one. Uh, we're going to be getting into a specific a, um, a thread under my subheading that's called Cosmic Ponderings. And this is where I tie in a lot of the cosmology or cosmism of Nibley and Larson and, and these people um, that I bring up, or the Saturnian cosmology, how I integrate it and look for it in the scriptures uh, to kind of test and prove it against the rod. So again, this is, uh, I've got 19 threads here. I haven't even made any videos on these threads. The Daniel 7 one and the Ezra's Eagle tangent, those were from uh, my other heading here in Visions for, for Daniel 7's Visions. So like, I have, I have a lot of material here that I'd like to record um, in case you know something happens to Twitter and all these threads just disappear, I'd be really sad. So we're going to be studying one in here. And the one we have for you today is the Pentecost, Cloven Tongues, and the Body Electric. I'll leave that on. How's that for an intriguing title? It's trying a little too hard, probably. So this one is uh, a short thread in development. Well, it was in the time. It's finished now. But touching on the concept in the scriptures of cloven tongues of fire, or right? like as fire. And I, I'm going to tie in some pop culture as well with the flux capacitor from Back to the Future and Joseph Smith's prophetic calling, the first vision, things like that, experiences with him. Um, and I say, hang on to your shorts, Morty. I mean, Marty. Oh, I'll be so cheeky here. It's because Morty and from Rick and Morty is a, a, off of based off of uh, Marty and Doc of Back to the Future. They both use portals. They both use these technologies and things. I thought it was fitting for where we're going to be going with this concept of cloven tongues. Um and, and when people are, are sh their face sh shown or is bright or shines, or I think the, the, the way it's described most is that their face is shown, like a Abinadi, like Moses coming down the mountain. We're going to talk about all that. So before I get in and read, I'm going to start with something out of uh, the, one of Joseph Smith's bodyguards, Philo Dibble, from his autobiography. I'm going to read a portion that relates to this idea of cloven tongues um, and, and people lighting up or their bodies looking different or, or light coming down. So if you don't know what cloven tongues are, where that reference comes from in the Bible, we'll read it first uh, here in it's the Acts. Yeah, there we go. Acts. Hold on, let me let me sign in. I'm gonna pull this off screen real quick because I did have some highlights I wanted to make <clears> sure that we go through. But how, what do you think so far? Are you excited for cloven tongues? <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, cloven tongues is a topic I I don't know what as much about as other topics. Uh, I, I have recently seen the Boy K. Packer talk uh, called Cloven Tongues of Fire. But there's a lot here that I've seen within you know, different cultures or anthrology or different things like that. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, and, and that, that's the point, too, of bringing the cosmos or, or looking at this through a cosmology angle is because some of these more obscure references or things that you might take or we have taken very spiritually or symbolically or figuratively in the past to say that there's actually, you know, some literality to this. Like the witnesses of people that were there said that there were literally like there was like fire above their heads. And, and just look at some of the depictions of here. This is the day of Pentecost um, in, in Acts 2. And uh, it's depicted. All, all I did was type in Pentecost and you go to an image now, search. Also, to jump in, speaking of that, I, I think I missed it. Anthrology. I obviously meant anthropology. That's I, what I heard fire. in my mind. I, I had a slip of tongue there, but yeah, yeah. Okay, you got it. I got it. <clears throat> so if you do, if you just Google... Uh, Pentecost or cloven tongues or anything like that, you're going to have a whole lot of different images where it looks like there's some type of, you know, fire phenomena happening above everybody's uh, heads here. Here you have like a soft light bulb version of it or like a, a soft glow that's coming down and, and still they've got these little white flames coming up above their head and the Holy Ghost and some type of orb. Well, also, this down. is also where you jump in and say, let's, let's not Google it. Uh, duck, 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 go it. Yes. Right? Not only because Google is evil. But it's very interesting if you type in religious uh, phrases and duck that go and Google, you're going to get very different things, very different pictures. And very often you see truth and beauty on duck that go for whatever reason. And on Google, it's more insulting. So yes. duck that go it. 
Duck, duck, go it, up. please. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. I, I, no, that is important because I do. <laughs> I I build a lot of my threads just looking at images. Where I'll Google certain or not Google, I will duck, duck, go certain words <laughs> literally, right. and, and then I, I will just kind of browse in for what I'm looking for. I know in my mind's eye what I'm what I'm trying to see, and I know how I've seen it before depicted in, in certain things. Here's you have the same concept of flaming tongues of fire above their heads, combined with the halo. I believe it represents. This is something the same that thing. you can do as a listener to try at home to look for evidence of this. Is that you can type in Pentecost and duck, duck, go, and type it in in Google and look at the difference in images. And then you'll know it's true because Google's evil and trying to lie to you and trying to hide it from you. Yes. So, yes, no more down with the technocracy. Okay, right. so let's read right here in in Acts chapter two, and uh, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So a bunch of believers in faith in one place. It's a lot of you know bodies and auras combined together. Some a lot of electricity in that in that environment, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were filled with gifts of the Spirit, with light and truth and knowledge and visions and understanding. And some of them were caught up into heaven. Like It, it was an amazing experience. But listen to the physical aspects of this that I'm going to be focusing on in my thread. That not only were they together and of one mind, one heart, and looking for God, essentially— uh, but there was a rushing sound that accompanied a mighty wind. These are, again, things that accompany, uh, if you were expecting some type of plasma event or a whirlwind or a tempest or lightnings like you've never seen before, they would, they would be accompanied by sound and wind. Even electricity at high voltages and things like that, they make a sound, right? And they create ionic wind when, when you have a current running through or you have you know, a positive and a negative anode where you do have that, that, that environment, that ionized air in between where you can have a snap of lightning collapse like that that's that's exactly what i'm seeing here in my mind's eye and i hope i'm describing it or at least getting close to why i think this is important to go into detail about it ryan any, any thoughts on that yeah i think the pictures uh do a great job showing it as well so i can definitely see it yeah and, and do it on your own go through spend 10 minutes just looking at images and familiarizing yourself with how it's been depicted throughout you know since it happened um to me having more information leads me to integrate a, a more synthesized picture uh, where i can see all the different depictions and and make sense of it because in a plasma paradigm that i'm trying to speak here this makes sense all of it does all of them are beautiful and i don't know exactly what it might have looked like but it's conveying the message clear and loud that there's some type of uh, illumination literally going on so with that in mind uh here's another um hold on the zoom window got in the way boomer moment here all right Here's Moses coming down from the mount again with this same phenomena happening. Now it could have been it could have been uh, depicted with a halo too, or both, right? And it would have been proper. Um, it could have been depicted where his face is totally white and shining. His body has changed, like he looks like he's glowing. That would have been mighty proper as well, right? But this is the way they d they decided to d to depict it here, uh, where he's receiving uh, revelation from on high. He's glowing because he's coming out of a transfiguration event. So we'll get into that, but think of these things. I'm throwing words out there now for your mind to like, to the, for them to be seated in your mind. That when you think of cloven tongues of fire and flame, when you think of illumination, when you think of a light bulb idea, right? When you think of revelation, um, also be thinking of, dang it, I lost my train of thought. What was I going to say, Ryan? <laughs> you're going to see it, and you're going to see it in a, lo a lot of places, though, right? Like the same symbolism, the same depiction. Right. Oh, that they're going to see it all over. That they represent the same thing, essentially. That. Uh, Somebody has been filled with the Holy Ghost, the light of Christ, the power of God, right? And their form changes. Their body is transfigured to withstand that kind of power and knowledge and input. Um, and so when he came down the mountain, he looked a little scary. And we read that in Exodus 34. Let me refresh this because I signed in. Um, and at the bottom is when he's bringing down the Ted tablets right here, this very picture. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets uh, the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, uh, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. And Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses. Behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. So it wasn't just that he was like glowy, you know, had that afterglow look. I just was talking with the Lord, and here I come down the mountain, like, look at me, I'm glowing. No, they were afraid of him. That's how much he was glowing and how 
bright. He looked physically. Something physically was happening that they were afraid of him coming down to the mountain. Okay. Now, okay, we'll continue on because I think you and I were having a conversation I was going to tie in that the listeners now would, wouldn't get. So, okay. Yeah. And, and Moses called unto them. And Aaron, okay, so he calls unto the, the rulers and they go up to Moses and he talks to them. But how does he talk to them? He says, and afterwards, all the children of Israel came nigh and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. So he finally comes down and delivers the message. Now, now, think of this in context too. This is an angelic, this is a ministration event where the prophet is speaking um, on behalf of God. He is, he is acting as the messenger um, for God. That's what all angels do. That's what all transfiguration events are, is a communication of some message or knowledge or power or keys, right? And it's, it's this transaction that has to take place where the mortal individual's body must change to not be destroyed by the immortal body or the uh, immortal glory that it is beholding, okay? So he had to come down and wear a veil on his face. So Moses had done speaking with them. He put a veil on his face to cover it so that they wouldn't be maybe focused too much on how he looked, his glow, and to, to miss the message because the message was much more important than his appearance. So he had to wear a veil. Um, it brings me back to, I want to say, DNC 50, right? That which is of God is light, and he that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. Where you have this common theme of as you're receiving revelation, right? You're having that change take place. But in this case, at a very literal level, right? Yes. His body, his literal body as a temple was filled with the Holy Ghost. And like we see our temples lit up at night or whatever. His, his temple was lit up at night, uh, pronouncing and announcing to all who could see him, I bring a message of God. I bring covenants of God. And here he brought the, the tables, the, the Ten Commandments, the uh, covenants of God. So here's a question, because if we're looking at other people who are clearly in direct communication with God, or even when we are ourselves, right? We're not glowing with light, but we still see the symbolism, right? Like the, mm -hmm. the twin... Not twin forks, but what's the word I'm looking for? The, the cloven. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The that. Y. Yeah, the the, the, the the cloven Y, right? The, the cloven tongues. Um, you, like I said, you see it symbolically in many places, such as uh, the Book of Abraham, the, right? Oh, yeah. We'll get into that, too. I think in my thread, I've got some pictures that show yeah, the, the, the Y, even in right there in the depiction of Kolob, where you have the central hub of light and delivering with the same uh, imagery. Of a so so it's lightning. it seems like because of these events and obviously revelation being associated with them that people start to use this to almost symbolize c commune with with God right yes where it could be it can be literal but also symbolic in cases as well right yes one hundred percent and it gets distorted by Satan as well because this this idea of horns on the forehead if you type in and I think I might have it here uh, just type in again in duck duck to go not that evil Google right. Yeah, Type in Moses <laughs> Moses with horns. Type it, because this is how he's described, and Michelangelo drew him as this, right? He's got little stumpy horns here. This is why they say Mormons have horns, right? This is why they would say that, is because we have revelation, and they don't, right? That's how I take it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But honestly, this is why he's depicted that way, is because of this concept of him coming down the mountain and showing or being transfigured and having this light emanating from his body uh, in such a powerful manifestation. And here, I love this. That thing is too... Is that like, so I, I've actually tried it right now, the Google and Duck, Duck Go. Mm -hmm. They're actually kind of the same in this case. But in several other cases, like, for example, the most dramatic was like the Christian throne of God. Yes. That one. It is insane how there are totally opposite searches and several other searches as well. So not every time. Sometimes Google wants to trick you into thinking it's a good search engine. but don't Maybe worry. we're esoteric enough that the algorithms aren't caught on to some of the imagery that, you know, we're talking about. That's right. Talking, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, too, we're too deep for that. Too That's deep. Right. Three deep. <laughs> But I like this yeah. image, too, of Moses because here he is holding up his arms in battle, and, and you guys know the story, too. Um, but he's, he's receiving the same revelation. He's receiving the same connection and acting in proxy, you know, as God there at the battle there to, uh, you know, encourage the, the troops, et cetera, et cetera, or bring actual power down to transmit it. Maybe he's acting as the, uh, um, the translator. <laughs> what, what's the word I was looking for? The trans—dang um, it. Where it steps down the power. No, no. Transformer. He's oh, acting yeah, for the yeah, transformer, transformer yeah. of God's power to to the people, essentially, like the vessel, um, the, the the rock, the Peter. That's exactly what he's acting as in here, and I like just how it's it's got the same depiction. Or check out the horns uh, here. It's the full on ram horns, right? And, and that seems very strange and would almost seem satanic because that's how modern Hollywood portrays the devil is having usurped this same form of revelation and night or, or, or light and knowledge, or even the very name Lucifer being the light bearer 
right? This is why they would depict him as that. It's a corruption of a true principle, a physical thing that happens when somebody's transfigured or full of illuminated light, like celestial knowledge and glory, right? Or depending on whatever power they hold. That's what you're going to see. It's, you're going to see them, them in their, as they are. It's symbols where, in many cases, let's just say the Vikings, right? You yeah. Talk, you've seen it as being something terrorizing, right? This horned demon's going to come and raid your village, where you also have cases where it's symbolic of, you know, communion with God. Well, yeah. And, and this is, I've mentioned it before in a lot of my other threads, but it, I should go over it again, I guess. Now. I don't have the pictures quite yet. Maybe I do here to put them up. But um, when you have this this Saturnian configuration of planets that we talk about, this crescent often appeared like bullhorns, right? And, and Mars would come down as well, and it would take different shapes and look like a cow. So if you had, and, and this same phenomena happens, this, this crescent or... Uh, it's almost like a shock wave, this, this uh, Birkeland current that forms when a planet is passing over or when planets are just in close proximity. That's why it's happening here, because these planets were in pl- close proximity in polar alignment. So when we're talking about things like Moses and an exodus during a Passover, like it's not just the spirit of the Lord that was passing over, but there was a host as well. There was a planet. There was actual something that caused all of these crazy plagues that caused the, the river to split in two, for the, the fire on the mountain, uh, everything. The pillar of fire by night and the, the cloud of smoke by day. Like all of these things were the result of what I believe was a catastrophe involving an actual star or planet in close proximity, a passing over, right? And this same bowl-shaped figure would manifest in the sky as these events were, were taking place. So this is why you have it glorified in um, Egyptian literature, you know, like uh, religion and uh, mythology and these esoteric things where you have this cleft form um, around a planet, okay? Because it, as well as it, if it's traveling, you could see this as the coma or the tail of like a comet almost, right? If it's moving around or passing over. And this is exactly why you would depict it this way. This is the, the twin mountain or the triple mountain, like I, I like to call it, which shows up in the hypocephalus image right here in the, in the middle. Oh, that's not a great picture. Any, any one of these old ones, right? Like here's the, you can kind of see the, yeah, yeah you, go. you've got the triple mountain here. And this is the bottom legs of the bottom legs of the squatter man, which is uh, this plasma figure here. You can see that these are the legs. And here you have the Y at the top, the terminus. Okay. It's the same electrical structure and you've got these round planets filling the, the gap. These are even called planets, 22 and 23, when you look how Joseph Smith labeled them. And here you have that same phenomena of like the bullhorn crescents, but above a monkey? What? It's because it's a, a, the ph- phenomena of what was cosmically happening, right? This is, this, and they borrowed the light from Kolob. That's how these things revolved, these planets. Well, Kolob in the middle, in my, in my paradigm and in the Saturnian cosmology was Saturn in the uh, antediluvian era, eras. And uh, later it was Jupiter that was the star of heaven, and that's during the ages of Melchizedek, like from Noah down to Abraham. Uh, and then after that, you had the Passover of these other planets as we all fell in line around the new sun, which currently rises east to west for you and I in 2021. So th- they're depicting the ancient heavens, okay? Literally, the old heaven, the old earth. That's what these things are. And this is what all this stuff harkens back to. Um, I've gone on a big tangent, and we didn't even start in the thread yet. So, <laughs> But this is good. I think it's necessary and hopefully um, helpful for many other people, but I love this picture of Moses. I might make this the cover of the video. Okay, with that being said, any questions so far? I know I've left some things out, but we'll get back to them. I'm just looking at the uh, facsimile of Abraham, the second one, right? Mm -hmm. Where it has the, once again, that the star is represented by number 22 and from the revolutions of Kolob, just like like you were saying. Yeah. So So these are, these are described by Joseph Smith as stars right? Planets. I call them planets are stars. Planets are stars in embryo, just like we are yeah. gods in embryo or co-heirs with Christ to the Father's kingdom. Same idea that we will grow up and evolve and we're progressing towards an eternal destiny. And so are the planets. Um, okay. Oh, I did want to read right here. Um, Isis and Hakokoabim. <laughs> I try to pronounce those, but. Some yes. of those Egyptian names. Yeah. It can yeah. be a trip, but, <laughs> but when they're broken down, they, they represent these cosmic things that I'm talking about, that this isn't some taboo thing that I'm delving into, but that it's plain in our standard works and people just skip over it or pretend that um, it's impossible to know without seven PhDs or something. But it's not like when you break it down to the, to the foundation, these symbols and what they mean almost literally, then a baby could understand this, right? Oh, he's filled with the power of God. He's being transfigured. He's got the cloven home. Like he's, he's illuminated. Listen to him. That represents God, right? Now, this ties in here. 
Moses comes down the mountain and his face uh, shone, right? Well, I was going to play uh, this this very d- description here of Moses coming down the mountain is part of one of my songs, Passover. So shameless plug here for some of my music. But this was it gets me excited is that I'm, I'm infusing these types of understandings, these types of my study habits and things into my music. So when I listen to it, I'm remembering all of these types of things, these types of phenomena that are happening and how it helps me understand the Exodus better. And that if we understand the Exodus better, we will be better prepared for the apocalypse that we are about to step into. That that's what I believe like the a real big um, benefit to studying these types of things and the Old Testament coming up next year. I'm super excited because uh, this plays totally into a cosmic, uh, you know, Messiah paradigm where we are waiting for the cosmic Moses to come down who will be Jesus Christ himself, right? It, and, and he's not going to wear a veil on his face, <laughs> right? When, when he comes to see us, that's what's going to be crazy. Those who, who fear him will fear him as well, just like the Israelites feared Moses coming down from the mount. It, it's such um, a parallel. It is obvious to me that this studying the Exodus will prepare us for the second coming beyond that. Okay. So this is baked into my song Passover here, which again, about planets and things, but let's see. I hope it's not too loud. I'm going to jump right in the middle of the song right about here um, because this stanza speaks specifically to Moses coming down with a veil on his face. And this is my favorite part of the song. It's actually the middle point of the song too, intentionally. Uh, It's kind of the same repetitive stuff leading up. And then this is the climax of, Christ coming down, the second coming, or Moses coming down with the veil on his face. And then uh, it's just my favorite part. Anyways, I like this song probably more than I should. <laughs> it's not one of my best ones, but the poetry in it to me is so powerful. So here it goes. How many did it have the faith to follow prophets and survive? Before the miracle, a trial of the faith, blood and fiery hail, stones anointed by ten plagues. Ten commandments, they were written on stone plates. Then he sent him down the mountain with a veil on his face. I... Yeah, so I, I love that portion. I love that line. Um, when I recorded it, I was full of the spirit, felt it, and I feel it when I listen to it again. So like, this is the power that I have, or the creative power and, and remembering power that this music does has for me. So I hope in sharing some of these concepts and tie-ins, when you listen to the music, it can bring your mind back to these holy and sacred and amazing things that we are looking forward to in the millennium. Okay, shameless plug over, but clicking on the reference to shown. Because we want to be sure, am I really talking about what I'm talking about? Or, you know, is this something different? Yeah, it is because it's in the Book of Mormon. It's in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the Joseph Smith history. And we're going to we're gonna read those. I'm going to force you to listen to them. <laughs> and, and look here, topical guide. What does it say? Transfiguration. So we're talking about a transfiguring event where I'm not making that up. Here it is right here in your reference. So in Mosiah, uh, same thing happens to who? To Abinadi as he comes in. Now it came to pass, this is in Mosiah 13, verses 5 through 6. Now it came to pass after Abinadi had spoken these words that the people of King Noah durst not lay their hands on him, for the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, right? Same situation where you got a guy glowing up, right? Lighten up, literally, and people being afraid. And his face shone with exceeding luster. There we have another descriptor to combine with the word shone. So when somebody's face shones, we should be expecting luster, a literal brightness, even as Moses' did while on the Mount Sinai. There's a direct reference back, tying us, giving us more context in the Book of Mormon of what happened uh, in the Old Testament and the Bible. This was a transfiguration event. And we could compare this too to the uh, Mount of Transfiguration in the New Testament. That's what I'm talking about. It's, It's in every book of our standard works that these things are manifest and testified of. And... Joseph Smith had a transfiguration event too with the first vision. So like, it, again, the last dispensation starting off with the same type of thing. Moving on, Helaman 5.3, 536. And it came to pass that he turned him about. So this is when Nephi and Lehi are uh, in the prison. They've been imprisoned by some wicked people. And one of the soldiers there in the jail turns and looks through the, the uh, chaos because all of a sudden there started to be a whirlwind and all kinds of stuff happening in the prison as the spirit was going to release them. And it says, and it came to pass that he turned about him and behold, he saw through the cloud of darkness, the faces of Nephi and Lehi. So again, he's seeing through darkness, a brightness and it's Nephi and Lehi, their faces again being shown. And behold, they did shine exceedingly, even as the faces of angels. Okay. So angels faces also shine. This goes back and supports my point that Moses is acting as an angel, as a minister, as a messenger right? That's what all angels, they come, they deliver a message. An angel's not just going to come to show you a far out time and be cool friends with you. That's not what they do. They deliver a message. So again, shine, angels, uh, light, luster. These are all words that you should automatically tie to every time you hear this, this type of concept happening, transfiguration. 
And he beheld that they did lift their eyes to heaven, and they were in the attitude as if talking or lifting their voices to some being whom they beheld. So yeah, there you go again. Another visitation. Moses up visiting with Jehovah. Joseph Smith visiting with the father and the son or with Moroni or whoever it is. And uh, they're speaking to somebody who's there transfiguring their form, causing the transfiguration because they're in the presence of another being who is guiding them, telling them what to say, what to do. Okay? That's this, uh, like their avatar, the avatar of whatever celestial being sent them down or whatever powerful being sent them down. Okay. Doctrine and Covenants 110.3. This is a description of, of Jesus. His eyes were as a flame of fire. The hair of his head was white like the pure snow. Again, here we have eyes as a flame of fire. So this light, luster, brightness, plasma, flame, fire actually is literally plasma. The hair of his head was white like pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun. Again, there we go. Another th- another uh, descriptor we can add to what happens when somebody's transfigured or shown. Bright above the brightness of the sun. So those should be keywords in your mind as you're reading the scripture. Something described as above the brightness of the sun or the luster of the sun or anything like that. Think, is this a transfiguration uh, concept or anything like that? Those are keywords. And his voice was as the sound of rushing great waters. Again, we have a noise, a, a rushing wind um, accompanying this type of event. A literal thing. Your senses are being overwhelmed with these things when this type of situation is before you. Even the voice of Jehovah saying, and then he speaks. And then last, Joseph Smith history, um, verse 32. Not only, and he, this is here, he's speaking of Moroni. Not only was his robe exceedingly white, but his whole person was glorious beyond description. So glorious, light, glory. And his countenance truly like lightning. Oh, there's another electrical plasma. Because again, lightning literally is plasma. But it's here it's being described it, to describe somebody with intense uh, spiritual power and a body powered by that. They're glorious, countenance like lightning, beyond description. Whole person was white. And this isn't a racial thing either. It's a power thing. Literal, your your blood is replaced with this luminescent spirit fluid. The room was exceedingly light, but not so very bright as immediately around his person. So yeah, he, he lit up the room, but immediately around him, like a halo or something, he was glowing, right? He was in like this this uh, environment of fire and flame. He probably would have, oh, and Joseph Smith did say when he first came, he was kind of affrighted. And most angels, when they appear to people, they frighten the people. The people gasp, or, and, and what do they say usually? What's the first thing they say, Ryan, when an angel appears? Uh, I'm not sure what you're referencing. Oh, fear not, right? Fear not. Oh, that's right, that's right. Okay, I thought, I thought, I thought you meant the people to the angels. <laughs> so I was like, hold on. Yeah, that could be a, that could be a, a whole mix of answers. But no, but yeah. they, they assuage the fear normally. Or even Christ, when he appeared to um, his disciples on the boat, on the, and they thought he was a ghost, right? Why would they think he was a ghost? Because he looked pale? No, yeah. probably because he was lit up like this. He was lit up like Moses coming to them, looking and glowing. Wouldn't a ghost look like they're glowing, just like Moroni is being described here? And he's walking on water using that same power, probably, the laws he's manipulating because he's full of that light that he can just walk on the water, and that there was a storm around him. The wind, the lightning, all those things are matching a transfiguration event, that they were literally watching probably Christ as a transfigured person. And and what did Peter do? He reached out and made that electrical connection and was able to walk on the water for a moment. But when he focused on the storm and everything else, it broke that connection and tie and he fell in the water. Do you get what I'm saying? Like this is where I, I, I was also thinking about how not only when you're transfigured, but when you're working with the power of God, you very commonly have these type of uh, depictions. So you mentioned Peter, for example, right? Mm-hmm. I'm also thinking, of, for example, Nephi when he kind of shocks Simon and Lemuel, yes. right? He had that same type of force. Yeah, and, and Laman and Lemuel immediately recognized it. They said, "We know that that's the power of God," and they backed off and they were afraid. Again, you have the same connection to these events, or, or Paul on the on the Saul on the road to Damascus. What happened to him physically in his vision of Christ? He was blinded, right? An intense bright light blinds him physically. Also, he was seeing and having a vision while the people around him didn't see what he was saying. So he was having a transfiguration event to be scolded, essentially, right? But that event it was like a jump start to his heart to switch and change and, and fight on the side of God instead of the enemy. Now, Joseph here describes. When I first looked upon him, I was afraid again, but the fear soon left me. Common theme, right? It's it's startling to be in the presence of something that powerful, right? Or that out of the ordinary, extraordinary. So I wanted to go through those scriptures. I thought that was important to kind of reiterate that I'm not making this up in terms of that there's a literal thing that happens. And here's all the scriptural evidence from the standard works. So uh, come at me, bro. Like that's, I wanted to start with that because I know, that's a concern. Like, is Leland teaching doctrine or is he just, you know, making stuff up and speculating? Well, I mean, 
tell me, tell me where I'm going wrong. And I'm, I'm happy to incorporate whatever feedback anybody has uh, about these types of topics. In fact, I'm starving for that kind of interaction. That's why I'm out here sharing is because these do no good inside my head. I have to share them because they, they help me so much. And I know they can help you in understanding some of these, maybe what you might've thought were more mundane or dull portions of the scripture that are describing magnificently amazing things, things that we, I believe are about to partake of as this outpouring of the spirit is about to take place here among the saints uh, before the world really starts to turn. Okay. Good stuff. All right, let's get back to the thread. And uh, here we go, finally. But but uh, instead of reading it from here, I'm going to read the story straight from the autobiography of Philo Dibble, as I mentioned, that this is a bodyguard of uh, Joseph Smith. I had some pictures of him and things, but I encourage you to look him up. I speak a lot about some of the things he did, some of the things he shared. He's the one that drew the depiction of the polarly aligned planets that Joseph drew for him, and he had it notarized. Like, this is legit. I'm not making it up. But in his journal, he has a couple uh, sections here that I'd like to read. Um, the first one has to do with this, this transfiguration event, where he says uh, he was visiting back and forth in his journal here, uh, visiting Joseph and Hiram as they were doing the translation work or uh, receiving a revelation. And he says, on a subsequent w- visit to Hiram, and that's the location, I arrived at Father Johnson's just as Joseph and Sidney were coming out of the, the vision alluded to in the Do- Book of Doctrine and Covenants, DNC 76. And that's the three de- the degrees of glory, the marvelous vision of heaven, in which is mentioned the made of, oh, he says it, in which mention is made of the three glories. Joseph wore black clothes, but at this time seemed to be dressed in an element of glorious white, and his face shone as if it were transparent. Again, another descriptor we can add from some, again, this is anecdotal, it's not in the scriptures, so take it for what you will. But here's another brother in his journal describing the same type of transfiguration, revelation, messenger giving uh, experience as his face showing as if showing as if he was bright, glorious white, uh, a glow about him, and transparent, another word, almost like crystal, right? But I did not see the same glory attending Sidney Rigdon, he continues. Joseph appeared as strong as a lion, Oh, there's that word again. You know how much I've heard that that. before. Yeah, lions. (laughs) That's interesting. Joseph appeared (laughs) as strong as a lion, right? But Sidney seemed as weak as water. And Joseph, noticing his condition, smiled and said, Brother Sidney is not as used to it as I am. (laughs) Yeah, that's why I was uh, jumping right away as well. Well, you got to get used to it. Any thoughts on that before I move on? Uh, No, go ahead. (laughs) Okay, so um, I don't think this one's as much necessary, the ones that I've highlighted here. it feels very like how whoever thought I have is like what he says next, anyways. <laughs> like your DNC seventy six. Like, oh, actually, nice read it. Oh, never mind. He yeah, still says it exactly. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so he says here. Um, oh, one part he got shot. He was in a gunfight defending the saints or something. I just like some of the descriptions of how nice. tough he was. He's like, I bled inwardly until my body was filled with blood and remained in this condition until the next day at five p.m. <laughs> <laughs> I was examined by a surgeon who was in the Black Hawk War who said that he had seen a great many men wounded but never saw one as wounded as I that ever lived. He pronounced me a dead man. Now listen to this, because here's where he has kind of this miraculous recovery, but it's accompanied by, again, a cosmic event. So here we go. He says, David Whitmer, however, sent me word that I should live and not die. So here's the word of faith. But I could see no possible chance to recover. He could see that his physical body was filling with blood for days. Like, that's crazy. After the surgeon had left me, Brother Newell Knight came to see me, and he sat down on the side of my bed. He laid his right hand on my head, but never spoke. I felt the spirit resting upon me at the crown of my head before his hand touched me, and I knew immediately that I was going to be healed. Now, I just want to tangent on this because it's coming to my mind now, but this uh, is a topic I haven't written a thread on yet. I've hinted to, like in my thread on the new church logo and stuff, that the laying on of hands and the consecrating of oil and things like that, they have a real physical purpose too. It's not just a ritual symbolic um, gesture. It, it can be and is and is full of that, yes. And it's connected in every way possible that you can think of. But I am saying add a literal physical element of spirit. Imagine if somebody is full of the spirit like Moses was and glowing. If he could reach out and pass that light on to somebody who was of faith. Now think of the woman who touched the hem of, of Christ, right? And virtue went out of him. This is what I'm describing. That physical contact and touch or proximity matters. And I think this plays into, too, and encouraging all saints and you listening to go to church. Get with other faithful people with same morals and standards and who are keeping and striving to keep the same covenant path. You will be enriched by their glowing environment. You will be edified by them and they you. It's a reciprocal relationship. This is an interdependent gospel. This is why the new and everlasting covenant is eternal marriage, a cohesion of two poles in 
like an electrical ceiling permanency. Those are big words, but break it down. And, and I know I'm making sense. So he says, and I'm continuing, it seemed to form like a ring under the skin. So he's talking about the spirit uh, that he felt under me. And it followed down my body. Again, I think of like a med bed or like Star Trek and you have them lay down and a ring of light goes down through them and it's healing them. This is what I'm envisioning in my body. That he's seeing this in his mind as it's playing out as Elder Knight puts his hand on his head. Now, when the ring came, uh, when the ring came to the wound, another ring formed around the first bullet hole and also the second and third. So this ring he's visualizing starts forming around the different wounds he has. Then a ring formed on each shoulder and each hip and followed down the ends of my fingers and toes and left me. And immediately I rose and discharged three quarts of blood or more with some pieces of my clothes that had been driven from my body by the bullets. I then dressed myself and went outdoors and saw the falling of stars. And it's an event he hints down here to, or gives more detail to in the next paragraph, but I'll, I'll keep going. So he walks, so he has this experience where Brother Knight puts his hands on his head and he sees light and rings go through his body, identify where the wounds were and heal them up or push the, the corruption out. And he ejects all this blood from his body, this corruption, all uh, comes out of his body. Now imagine if you were filled with light and it could purge your blood and heal you, this would make sense by laws, by the same type of law that Moses is experiencing here where his body is filled with some type of element. And we know that there are other quotes and things like you mentioned, I think in a previous conversation about being baptized and having your blood changed to be the literal blood of Abraham, that there's some type of, uh, what, what would the Catholics call it? Like a, a transubstantiation going on, right? A changing of element within your body. Um, this seems to be the case here, but the... The mechanism for it was this priesthood blessing by Brother Knight and manifested to uh, Philo Dibble as this ri these rings of light healing him. So I dressed myself, he says. I'm continuing on with his journal now. I then dressed myself and went outdoors and saw the falling of stars, which so encouraged the saints and frightened their enemies because they were in this battle. It was one of the grandest sights I ever beheld. From, the time, uh, from that time, not a drop of blood came from me. And I never afterwards felt the slightest pain or inconvenience from my wounds, except that I had somewhat, I was somewhat weak from the loss of blood. Can you imagine this? Like, this is miraculous. This is a miracle. And, and not just a miracle, but vivid. And he recalled it, wrote it in a journal. Uh, he seems to have a lot of these types of experiences. And I, I feel like those who write these things down, uh, share them, are believers and have faith that these types of things can happen. Like we were talking about before, the law of attraction is real right? You think these things, you believe these things, you have faith in these things, and it pays dividends. It really does. This part is interesting to me in a lot of regards, right? We're looking at someone who is purified and he uh, ejects or vomits blood or whatever he's doing here, right? And he's filled with light instead. I believe that it says in DNC essentially that our resurrected bodies, like, won't use blood. We'll use something different. Yes. Like light, right? And you look at that idea. So, for example, you have cultures where, where bloodletting was used to try to cure you, right? Yep. You are going to release toxins and different things like that through releasing blood, right? Or even religions that uh, are against blood transfusions, right? Where you don't want to transport someone else's blood to you, right? Because blood is full of things, right? So Yeah. Several. Well, and, and I think that it, a study and maybe even a whole thing on blood in general, like blood doctrine, would be... A yeah. really cool thing because um, just think of some of the common language things that bind this together to this topic. Like, I kind of had, had to stop myself for a bit because it's like we get tangent on that. Yeah, no, we can. And, but I think it's, we'll I just think we go should, back to we should talk about it now because otherwise we won't remember this. And uh, listening to it again, maybe somebody will remind us and prompt us, and eventually we'll put out a thread and and, and go more in depth on it. But uh, alcohol in the past uh, or even now in some places, it's called spirits, right? Because there yeah. there is an old. Uh, neolithic belief that in our blood contains our spirit in the heart is the seat of the spirit kind of thing and the blood pumps yeah. you know the, through the heart so this is where uh bloodletting or, or sacrifice and these types of things you're, you're releasing spirit into the atmosphere like there's there's a literality to it um when you have that type of paradigm and again this is a good tangent and i really think that we should address and, it and what you were what you're referencing uh, earlier and this is before we started recording but and i can't remember who it was but i believe one of the general authorities uh, made this claim or idea that when you're endowed or baptized or when you enter the covenant how the holy ghost will literally change your blood and it's not just that you're symbolically uh, a member of the uh, of the covenant but that your blood has physically changed where you are now a member of the covenant right you're of abraham yes Right. And so your blood can kind of go both ways. Right. Does it fill with flight? Right. Um, or does it fill with darkness? <laughs> yes. No. And I, and I think 
it's an important topic to dwell on too. Like what good is a bloody heart in the resurrection if no blood's in the resurrection? Like that's the corruptible element. That's what that's what changed in Adam and Eve when they ate the fruit. And there are, I have threads, we'll get to them. I have a thread that goes into all the different quotes from early church leaders and, and modern ones who have reaffirmed that doctrine that when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, their, their physical bodies changed and there was blood introduced. It wasn't blood that was running their bodies before. It was the spirit matter, the spiritual body that they had that we are returning to with uh, transfiguration, with uh, translations, like a step up into it, right? Uh, but, a, but, but a step below it. But our resurrected bodies will be full on a different liquid, like you're saying, this, this light fluid that will replace blood. So that's an important concept. And, and for me, especially because of some certain other ideas that, that I like to entertain. Um, you look at you know, blood atonement and it, it represents a shedding of blood for the Savior, right? And the, the atonement. Where by shedding of blood, you know, he's truly finished his mission on earth. He's left and will come back as a resurrected being. The blood has been shed. Yeah. Or think of him bleeding how many drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was, yeah. you know, using every ounce of that inherent light that he was born with. Only he was born with that, that celestial light that he had, that mantle was the only thing, you know, purging that blood at that time. So like I, I th- in that context, looking at everything, every mention of blood in the scriptures through kind of this type of spiritual context um, or with the resurrection in, in mind and transfiguration in mind and the blood of covenant. Like think about, too, when we uh, do our job and preach the gospel and live our covenants, we are clean from the blood of this generation, from the wicked blood of this generation. That's the kind of language that that we are used to and understand in the scriptures and um, in our sacred places. So there's definite importance here. Um, but jumping back into Philo Dibble's story, he, I want to end it because he, or, or at least this, this portion, because he explains a bit more about the falling stars, which I find curious um, to all of this in terms of the manifestations he seemed to experience on his level, his bodily level, in seeing things and having that healing be miraculous and, and feeling like he's glowing or all of these other wild manifestations happening. But you've also got some type of cosmic event happening at the same time um, on the earth because here he describes it. The next day I walked around the field and the day following I mounted a horse and rode eight miles and went through. Okay, that was not a very important one, but he rode his horse and you know, walked. And he walked after all of this right here. Okay, so that is important. Yeah, eight miles. Yeah, pretty yeah, f- okay, the yeah, next day sure. after ejecting three bullets by the spirit from his body and spitting up eight quarts of blood, three quarts, three quarts of blood or more. So he says, the night of the battle, okay, so now he's uh, recollecting the night before. The night of the battle, many of the women and children ran into the woods. One sister, not being able to take all of her children with her, left her little boy, four years old, out in a corn shock. Corn shock, I don't know what that is really, but corn shock, an area where some corn is, is what I can imagine, uh, where he remained until morning. Some went out of the burnt prairie. The mob gathered and swore they would go and massacre them. When they got ready to go, the heavens were lit up with the falling of stars. This brought to us a perfect redemption at that time. So, again, this manifestation, uh, I, I just have to wonder if they're, they're not connected in terms of how powerful he was seeing things happen on his local level, as well as some things happening on the planetary level that were very timely, right? What a coincidence. I don't think so. So, um, okay. These last two stories I do want to read, and I know it's going to make the video even that much longer, but I think it's worth it um, because I, for one, had not heard these stories ever. Um, well, one of these I had, this one I'm about to read, but the second one I have not, and I think it would be good to have them out there you know, for people to listen to or hear. So uh, here's, again, this, this first story is Philo describing another encounter with some hostile people towards the saints, and so they're out in uh, Zion's camp, and... Just before night, two men come up to the camp and ask where Mr. Smith was. And Joseph said, I am the man. I love that phrase. Just here comes people ready to take him away. He had been arrested. Um, People have been seeking his life for as long as he can know, but he's not afraid. And he just answers, I am the man. And they advised him to disband his camp for, they said, the mob are gathering and there won't be one of you left tomorrow morning. And Joseph smiled and said, I guess not. (laughs) Seeing that Joseph did not believe what they came to tell him, they went off vexed. We learned afterwards that the hail was so heavy on the mob that they were forced to seek shelter, and the leader of them swore he would never go against the Mormons again. So again, the confidence of Joseph Smith to just be like, yeah, I'm here. Tell me what. Okay, I guess guess we're going to be gone tomorrow. You know, like just totally mocking him. I love it. Okay. 
And then the last one, oh, I shared this on my Twitter, but I'll, I'll share it here. It's just a, a short, um, well, man, this could go on into a tangent, so maybe I don't share it. But it fits into Ezra's Eagle video and things like that, if you guys heard. While celebrating the 4th of July at Far West, there came upon a thunder shower, or they, there came up a thunder shower. And the lightning struck our liberty pole, flagpole, and shivered it to pieces. Joseph walked around on the splinters and said, As that pole was splintered, so shall the nations of the earth be. Food for thought, right? That's what we're looking for. That's what we're waiting for. And, and think about it. Th there's this lightning strike that happens. And what does the prophet do? Is he, is he out there, you know, fretting about, oh, what's going to happen to our, our liberty pole? We got to make a new one. No, he's out there like pontificating on revelation <laughs> on the end of the world. He's tying it to, wow, this is prophecy right here. We're watching a, a physical example. This is how he, he's making sermons out of splinters, right? We should all take that example, I believe. Okay, last story. It's kind of lengthy, but I think it's worth it. Um, you ready for this? Uh, bah, 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 bah. Okay, when Joseph first came to Nafu, Nauvoo, then called Commerce, a Mr. Hugh White living there proffered to sell him his farm for $2,500, $500 more of the amount to be paid down, or $500 of the amount to be paid down, and the balance one year from that time. Joseph and the brethren were talking about this offer when some of them said, we can't buy it, for we lack the money. Joseph took out his purse and, emptying out its contents, offered a half dollar to one of the brethren, which he declined accepting. But Joseph urged him to take it and then gave each of the other brethren a similar amount, which left him without any. Addressing the brethren, he then said, Now you all have the money, and I have none. But the time will come when I will have the money, and you all will have none. He then said to Bishop Knight, you go back and buy the farm. Brother Knight went to, the, to Mr. White, but learned from him that in that time, he had raised the price $100 and returned to Joseph without closing the bargain. Joseph again sent him with positive orders to purchase. But Brother Knight, finding that White had again raised the price still another $100, again returned without purchasing. For the third time, then Joseph commanded him to go and buy the farm and charged him not to come back until he had done so. When Bishop Knight got back to White, he had raised another hundred on the place, making the whole amount $2,800. However, the bargain was closed and the obligations drawn up. But how the money was going to be raised, neither Brother Knight nor the other brethren could see. The next morning, Joseph and several of the brethren went down to Mr. White's to sign the agreement and make the first payment on the land. This is a moment here, I'm just interjecting, where you have a Nephi going to get the plates and not knowing what beforehand what to do type of situation. This is what's developing. And you have a lot of the other brethren there, like super stressed out and tense by it. Uh, and Joseph's kind of calm and collected, like, go get it done. The Lord will make it happen. And that's the lesson. Yeah. Here. So uh, here he goes. He says, a table was brought up with papers upon it, and Joseph signed them, moved back from the table, and sat with his head down, as if in thought for a moment. Just then, a man drove up in a carriage and asked if Mr. Smith was there. Joseph, hearing it, got up and went to the door. The man said, good morning, Mr. Smith. I am on a speculation today. I want to buy some land, and I thought I would come to see you. Joseph then pointed around where his land lay, but the man said, I can't go with you today to see the land. Do you want some, any money this morning? Right? Coincidence? Joseph replied, and he, that, and he said he would like some. And when the tra stranger asked how much, he told him $500. The man walked into the house with Joseph, emptied a small sack of gold on the table, and counted out that amount. He then handed to, to Joseph another hundred dollars, saying, Mr. Smith, I make you a present of this. After this transpired, Joseph laughed at the brethren and said, You trusted in money, but I trusted in God. Now I have the money, and you have none. That's the end. I love that story. It's beautiful. Thoughts? Uh, I'm just imagining Joseph Smith coming back with the voice of a lion. I am the man, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, very strong personality. Yes. Okay. That's enough of Mr. Dibble's diary. We'll close that up. We'll get back to our thread. These first three uh, tweets in the thread are that first uh, experience I described where Philo Dibble seeing Joseph as if he were transparent, glorious white, a transfiguration, a transfiguration event after the receiving of the revelation of Doctrine and Covenant 76. Okay, moving on. This is one of but many accounts of the countenance and person of Joseph Smith being visibly altered to display light and glory. I invite those reading to post similar accounts they are familiar with uh, to this thread to help others easily find a connection. Nobody really took me up on that offer. But uh, again, as you're reading the scriptures, the standard works, 
uh, church history, anything like that, your family history journals, whatever it is, you're going to see this is a common theme in a pattern. I promise. It's eternal. Here's a quote from Joseph Smith. It mattereth not whether the principle is popular or unpopular. I will always maintain a true principle, even if I stand alone in it. He certainly did. Um, oh, this reminds me of the event where uh, in the three years of preparation before Joseph was allowed to gather the plates from the Hill Cumorah, he would go back to the same spot and check the plates out and Moroni would deliver the same message essentially each year, right? Well, I don't know if it was the first time or one of the, the preliminary times or visits to that Hill Cumorah, Joseph tried to retrieve the plates and, and uh, what happened when he reached in to try and take the plates? He was shocked. He was shocked so hard it threw him back, Okay. And then the, the rock was closed up and the angel was standing there like, it's not your time yet, right? So again, another example of electricity or an electrical plasma type phenomena or some type of uh, physical thing happening by the power and protection of light. Oh, here's another example. Nobody uh, posted the, the experience, but um, I don't remember which jail it is. And honestly, I'm not like a, a, a church historian. I admire and love all of the Latter-day Saints out there who are really down with the church history and know their stuff. In fact, I go to church every Sunday just eating off the table of members in my word that do know this kind of stuff, do have you know certain historical events in the church memorized or just on instant recall. Um, I tend to study a whole bunch of different things, and I think the excuse that I make, and it's a wrong one, is that like, oh, I'll get around to it. It's the same excuse people make for the stuff I try to introduce to them. They're like, oh, I'll get around to it. I don't have the time right now to study it. And in my mind, I'm like, when I get old, I'll study church history. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. It's like, when I, when I get old and I'm, I can't do much, then I'll go back through and, and really study church history. Not that I don't study any now, but I don't place a lot of like RAM, like instant memory recall in um, the dates or events of things. Even though if I did, I am confident. And in the little bit that I have, I am confident that you would find a cohesive layer of the same principles I'm teaching about the Old Testament or visions or whatever it is in, in the church history. It's a microcosm of the macrocosm. It's a fractal. It, it shows up everywhere. But this account is uh, whatever jail it was where the jailers and those scoundrels that were um, watching guard over them were bragging about raping the Mormons and killing them and the children and this and that and just had filthy mouths. And Joseph stood up and rebuked them. And um, he called them like infernal demons of hell or something. I, 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 again, I don't have it memorized. But in that moment too, he was transfigured and glowed because it, it struck fear. The fiery pit, right? Like demons in the fiery pit. Yes, or the infernal hells of the fiery uh, pit. You will cease yeah. this moment or you or I will die instantly or something. It was something like that. Like so Yeah, bold this right moment. Hit. Yeah, yeah. Now think of the threat as a literal threat. Very Joseph Smith-like. But imagine now like a Moses figure shining with his face shown and you can feel the electricity like Laman and Lemuel that this is the power of God. Holy crap, right? Yeah. And it shut these hard men with weapons up to this lion chained here, right? He stands up and roars, and it was physically felt. This is reminding me of Judah. Okay, Judah, if you read, um, I don't know what it is. It's the old tales, like the, the Testaments of the Patriarch. This one's an, apoc that one's an apocryphal text. Um, what's the big, long, like the Jewish uh, expounding on um, the books of Moses? And it includes... Yes, you're um, maybe, is that a, Wait, that say that again? Line. Not like the Talmud. Maybe it's the Talmud or something like that. Um one of these where they go into a lot of detail about the patriarchs and Abraham and, and um, some of the more apocryphal type tales of them. But one of them is, is Judah when he's coming to retrieve uh, Benjamin and fight with Joseph in Egypt during the, the famine, the seven years of famine. Um, in, the, in the descriptions of, of, that I'm thinking of, and I can't recall it. I'm going to have to look it up and maybe post a, uh, an update to it later or um, I'll tweet it out or something. But um, it describes Judah as having like the supernatural power to roar and put fear like in his enemies. He roared in the court of Joseph when, the, when he was fighting for Benjamin and to take him back to Jacob. And it said it struck fear in the military of Egypt of the time in the text I'm, re I'm referring to and remembering. Like he had some type of supernatural and all the patriarchs seem to have like uh, crazy warlike abilities. They were warlords. They were, you know, shepherds. They fought lions and bears and things like that. Like this, these were huge and, and likely physically larger men than normal, um, in my estimation, and based on the books. And now, now maybe that's a sensationalization uh, in the texts that they're making them bigger than they actually were or whatever. And I'm taking it a bit too literally. But what I'm, I'm saying is there is a principle of truth to this, that if they were men of God, right, full of the Holy Ghost and Spirit, that they would have access to these same types of gifts of the Spirit and transfiguration or infusions of, of power like the Pentecost 
to manifest the gifts of the spirit for for positive reasons. Um, and so that Joseph Smith as a lion roaring, you know, telling them either you or I die this instance, and perhaps he's in a transfigured state and so they feel it kind of thing. And that's why he glows and shows. Um, but yeah, I'm just remembering all that. This is how my brain works. I'm sorry. Another tangent. <laughs> but there we go. There's Joseph Smith. We're getting through pictures. And then the first vision event, another uh, transfiguration um, experience. Okay, continuing on. So compared to Moses in Exodus 34, 29 through 35, and his transfiguration experiences on the mount. We already read that. But I reject Rasmussen, Rasmussen's swipe at Michelangelo, who I say was obviously well-versed in the esoteric traditions where Rasmussen was not, at least not to the same extent. And what am I referencing here? Well, if we go to the Old Testament student manual, this is institute manual for the chapters that we read or the verse we read earlier about Moses coming down from the mount and wearing a veil and being illuminated. This is what they say, the commentary. After such prolonged time and such experiences in God's presence, it is no wonder that Moses' face shone with divine glory when he returned and the people fell back in fear of him. This phenomenon of light radiating from heavenly beings and earthly beings who are under heavenly influence is not unique here. Compare the descriptions of the apostles in the day of Pentecost when cloven tongue, or tongues of cloven fire radiated from them. And that's exactly what we've been doing. Uh, the Hebrew word here rendered shown is karan, a denominative word from a noun meaning horn, denominating radial beams of light, like the horns or rays of morning seen over the horizon. And here they want to, they're forcing it, in my opinion, they're forcing it to this modern um, solar system configuration, which it fits and that works, but that's not the only definition or how this was envisioned, right? But uh, I, my mind is immediately like pushed back against that because when I was ignorant to a lot of things that I know, I would take that quite literally as like, I just would have taken it too wrong. So I, I'm pointing that out. For this phenomenon, the Arabs called the sun at its rising a gazelle. And then he says here, this is Rasmussen's interpolation. He says, a mistranslation from Hebrew to Latin caused Michelangelo to put actual horns on the head of heroic statue of Moses. Oh, how silly. Right? Like he, he's trivializing something that I am seeing as sacred. And that's where I contend with this. And it's not his fault necessarily. I don't think. I don't think, you know, I, I believe that a lot of this stuff is coming to light now because we are at that stage where the Lord, as the prophet has said, is accelerating his work and that we should have access to put more pieces of the puzzle together. But here's Michelangelo's Moses that he was referring to with the horns. What a mistake? No, I don't believe it was a mistake. It's, a, it's just the same symbolic depiction that is culturally cohesive. Anybody from any culture that knew like what that meant was going to recognize it for what it was and not think that, he, oh, why did they think Moses is half gazelle? What? How strange. No, it was known. We're the idiots that suffer from the disease of presentism that can't consider that maybe something was actually happening that they're depicting symbolically. We lack the imagination, but we also don't ask. Yeah, either. we don't. We, assume, we look back and we just assume that they were stupid. And people will say, well, if it was important, the Lord would have told us. Oh, yeah? Well, his disciples in Jerusalem never asked about the ten tribes. He, he, he scolded them, essentially, when he visited the Americas and told his disciples there. He said, I'm telling you about the ten tribes now because you have greater faith than those in Jerusalem. They didn't even think to ask when I asked. And I said I had other sheep uh, that, are not this, not, that are not of this fold that I must go visit. They didn't say, oh, who are you going to visit? They just assumed that I was going to visit the Gentiles. They didn't ask, right? How often in the church do we assume that the prophets are going to tell you what to do, that you're going to assume that eventually we'll know that in the millennium, right? You never thought to ask. You never thought to even look at what other people think about that and integrate it with the gospel keys, you never thought to do that. I never thought to do that with a lot of these topics until I did. And now that's why I'm the way I am. But here's another awesome depiction of Moses looking real satanic. Oh, this is occult and evil. No, if you were ignorant, it would look occult and evil. But he's actually between the two pillars. He's under an arch. He's got all the, probably two cherubims at the top from him. He's got all the symbolism of God's throne. He's coming down as a messenger from God's throne. For goodness sake, he's, he's, those are his comet tails. And he's a planet coming down to rescue and save the earth. Like Joseph Smith said, the last grand sign before the coming of the Son of Man would be perceived as a comet or a planet by the world, right? They will think there will be a big crashing together of planets and a destruction, but not so. They will come together like breaks is what he, how he describes it. And this will cause the melting of the mountain, the friction between the planets, right? He described and used this language. That's an anecdote from when he, he was having a, a conversation with uh, Patriarch Brown. I could pull it up or reference it at another point. If somebody's interested, uh, put a comment in the video and I'll find a link. But this is what I'm talking about. This is perfect symbol symbolism to a T if you understand the cosmic aspects and what these um, are ultimately f physically and literally referring to or temporally referring to. Hope that point was clear. 
If not, let me repeat that. <laughs> this is exactly the next tweet. This phenomenon of light, or I'm repeating exactly what he said, radiating from heavenly beings and earthly beings who are under heavenly influence is not unique here. Compare the descriptions to the apostles on the day of Pentecost when tongues of cloven fire radiated from them. And here I included the scripture that we read earlier in this cast and uh, one of the cooler pictures that I saw, the Holy Ghost transmitting through these, think of them as tubes, right? Plasma tubes down to everybody. I'm saying that intentionally because I have uh, some planet plasma tubes to show you a bit later how it scales up. Okay, now, and we already uh, suggested this, but here I'm saying it in the thread. Take in more artwork that tries to convey cloven tongues like as a fire uh, of, pe of the Pentecost. And that's what I included here, a bunch of pictures of how it's depicted, this cloven tongues of fire. And you you'll just see the common themes. With more information, you're going to have better revelation as to what exactly is going on here. So tangent, Pentecost is the 50th. If Joseph's theophany, or the first vision, is a Pentecostal appearance, you know, transfiguration, dispensational, a dispensation opening experience, then we are currently not only, uh, we are not only, uh, we are currently not only a jubilee year now. Okay, I don't know. My English is terrible. I'm sorry. And then I type and I just let it go. And there's no edit button. Sorry, me so sorry. We are, not, we are currently not only in a jubilee year now in 2020, but also a latter-day Pentecostal year. So that would have been true for last year, 2020. And then what is cloven? Imagine a Y, something cleaved at a point. That's what cloven means. So like you have the bottom hooves of certain cloven animals, right? Cleaved to a point, two points, two mountains, twin mountains. Here you have it at the, as a footstool, bottom of a table or something. And I like that they put like hair over it um, because again, it could be like a river of fire or this pillar of fire coming down, the same type of idea. And here I, I flip this upside down just so you could see this cloven shape, right? These are hooves. Now, now compare this to the crown of Israel. Like what is he wearing on his head? When you look in, in certain forms of this, they're, they're imitating the same form of Moses being resplendent, coming down, showing and everything. The high priest in, in, the, in the garb and everything you do, you wear, you say, you're, you're imitating these types of archetypes, all right? You're going to see that cloven. And, and again, with the crown of Egypt, that same cleft and cloven top right it's everywhere now this is some freaky modern stuff but it's got the same general idea of antiquity and here's even a different configuration of it where you have it in a singular stream right planets were in a different motion they're not necessarily displaying the same type of um, experience that we would see from earth's perspective where it might look like something like this like a triple mountain coming down and that matches more of the hypocephalus look where you got the triple mountain in the middle or the two pillars and the, the man in the middle, Jesus, right? That's in our church lo logo where you have the two sides of the arch as the two pillars or two legs here, and then the man in the middle or the stairway up to heaven. Only through Christ, only through that narrow gate, through his gospel, can we receive uh, the highest glory up in Kolob. Okay, I hope that's clear. Any questions? I know I'm trying to think of the, the Jewish text that you were talking about because I know it, but I've had a, a little brain slip, I guess. But I was thinking about there's a it's a different 10th century text that's thinking about where you see it's interesting to look at ancient religious texts and some that are clearly apostatized or derivatives that are somewhat displaced from these events, right? Yeah. Where it almost becomes urban legend, right? And there's a book, I don't know how to pronounce it, specific, the Sefer Hamabush, uh, or the Book of the Garment. It's okay. like a 10th century Jewish text where essentially some would almost refer to like some kind of magical cloak, but it's like a cloak of light where you go through spiritual rituals or if you converse with angels and God, then you can get it right away. But through essentially purifying yourself and in incense and meditation, different things like that, how very similarly, you know, so but my, my point being, I need to find the book so I can <laughs> reference it right <clears throat> there what I'm talking about. But it's curious to me because that, that's totally yeah. along the line of the same mythology of um, what our symbolism of the garment that we wear is, that it's yeah. symbolic of the garment given to Adam, Adam and Eve in the garden. Yes. Uh, but if you follow the lore, like you're saying. That garment was passed down generation to generation, patriarch to patriarch. That's the garment that uh, Ham stole, right, from Noah in, in the drunken scene of the Old Testament that seems confusing or whatever. It's this gar garment of light from Adam, according to these ancient Jewish texts that you're referencing, um, if I'm recalling yeah. correctly. That that's, that's this garment. That This is the garment that Nimrod ultimately had that made him such a great hunter, right? This is the garment that was fought over or whatever um, for a long time. 
I wonder if it's well, not it, something it's, similar to like the the King's Regalia, because we know Adam was given also a Urim and Thummim and possibly certain other kingly type of, of things because even in, 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 in pop culture though too so for example you the, the breastplate image that you showed right the square uh, you think of like darth vader you know it's cringes perhaps to bring that up right yeah but he has that plate in the center that essentially kind of has hebrew letters in it or, or right? uh, Iron the Man? same kind of cloak of power yeah yeah exactly where he's got his core power that's you know above everyone else's heart or whatever that's powering him and this is the same the Urman Thummim was placed behind the ephod or these 12 gemstones uh, or symbolically over the heart to represent a pure heart right that's where that that, that crystal goes so yeah all those pop culture entertainment you know sci-fi type depictions star wars to whatever um they're essentially playing off the same archetype whether they think they're being totally original or not, they're not. There's nothing new under the sun, especially when we live in the planet of salvation of an all-knowing, omniscient God, right? Like, he, he, you are playing into his game, just like Satan thought he was being original. He wasn't. He was playing right into the game because he can't do anything without following the same stream, right? You, yeah. I don't want to go into too much more of a tangent on that, but... Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be careful because there's there's other books I want to bring up, but I think we'll do it another time. Yeah, and and... Maybe if we were more prepared with those, like these are just kind of on the, off the fly, but it's good because then we can put together maybe a follow-up or something or it's spurring yeah. new ideas to go study. I like it. And I listened to a lot of those books like on audio, maybe like five, ten years ago or something. And so the recall for me is, um, what do I want to call it? Like um, I, it's conceptual. I'm remembering concepts and certain things that really impacted me, but not necessarily where in the book I was or what chapter or even what book it was. I just know that yeah, I, where I, I it, experienced that. I, I, I know where it's at. It's like, okay, if I had some time to go find it. Yeah. Be, but, yeah, you just got to be good at looking that stuff back up and following up on it, actually doing that. And that's how you'll like ingrain it into your memory, into your heart and your soul. And it'll become some you know, treasure that you can think on or remember that brings you back into this type of mind state. Okay, which leads me back to my contention with Rasmussen. Here is also a gazelle. And I put up a picture of a gazelle. And I think the other thing I hear is just a re repetition of, yeah, his, where he's calling Michelangelo's depiction of, of Moses um, or it, them calling it, uh, the Arabs calling the sun at its rising a gazelle. He says that's a mistranslation from Hebrew to Latin um, or something. I think maybe I'm misunderstanding that now that I'm reading it again, that he's, he's saying the uh, translation from Hebrew to Latin caused Michelangelo to put the horns on the head of a heroic, heroic statue of Moses. Um, but Arabs called the sun at rising a gazelle. Why? Why would they call the sun at rising a gazelle? Well, I'm sure that there's some modern anthropological answer for that to you know tell you about the rising and setting of it and how fast it is or something. I don't know. But I know that the morning star, the original ancient sun, it had these these twin pillars just like this. This is why the worship of cows in India and all kinds or elephants or whatever it is. You know, this is why uh, the twin pillars of Solomon's temple. This is why you've got cloven tongues here. This is what's going to happen when the millennium starts and, and there's a connection between heaven and earth, essentially. right? You're going to have these pillars of heaven, which were reproved at the time of the flood. They will be restored at the time of the millennium. Okay, This is why this is a totally appropriate. And not only even is it appropriate, but it's got the ridges like a plasma Berkeley current uh, actually would. And I know I have a picture of this right here. They would have these types of striations or, or segments or um, arms they call them instabilities that hang out, right? And they form different things. And they look like dragon's heads. In fact, I think I had a, a tweet oh, just recently. I don't want to pull it up, but uh, I'm going to do it because I, it fits exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about here with these uh, arms coming out the side of the same discharge in the sky. Uh, let me find my latest tweets. I know it had to have been today. Yeah, here. So arts and... Uh, of America, Arts and Artifacts of America. Here's this depiction of, it says, pendant depicting a male figure with saurian heads emerging from the body. It's like dragon heads, snake heads, serpent heads coming, for, com coming from his body. Why would serpents be coming like this from his body? Why would he position in such a way? And why is there a protruding, you know, phallus or obelisk coming out of the center of the mass, right? And, and why the headdress and crown and why the swirling winds, right? Why all of these things? To me, it's obvious that it has relation to the squatter man, to the plasma discharges witnessed in the sky, where you've got these arms or instabilities um, that would have been manifest. This is the middle structure that you would see, but you would also see some structures like uh, like a river 
where walls would would form on either side if it was up in the the air um, or if if the power was enough like if you're having a planetary encounter you're going to see these major forms but like a solar flare could make these types of things like if it was the, if it was the right kind and hit us you know with the right force and everything we would see these types of things in the sky around us without even a planet to be there because it's a plasma phenomenon and and the sun ejects plasma at us right like so these things it, it would light up our our atmosphere the weather would change here drastically you'd have these crazy thunderstorms and things you would have pockets of fire coming down from heaven and and you wouldn't have to have necessarily like a venus or a mars passing so close that it was you know as big as a plate in the sky no it could happen at a distance and these would manifest for a time and, and disappear so like I think that's something that people don't understand as well when they're when I'm explaining this for the first time is that I say, oh, well, this was in the ancient heaven and you're just trying to imagine it just like there forever. But no, this structure changed and fluctuated in, in what it looked like and how it was depicted. And that's why you see such variations across the continents, but with such a general uniform um, framework, right? The basic bare bones are there, although it's it changes depending on how you were seeing it, where what time it was, what planet was causing it, all of that. Okay, um, this is all extracurricular. So I'm talking about the gazelle here, and oh, again, Egypt ka arms also meant the ka or the bull. This is why you would pray with your arms upraised, or why these were so symbolic of heaven and the bull and everything like that, and why Adam would have prayed that way coming out of the garden, and why we pray that way. Um, it, it's, again, a throwback to paradise, to these pillars of heaven. I, I made this image. It's from my video, uh, Follow the Prophets. Um, and I, it's just an overlay of a bunch of these things. Here's the planetary configuration where you see the horns and you see Christ uh, with his arms like a crucifix or crucified, but here he's you know, raising them up to the people and the plasma column coming down. So this is the alpha and the omega symbolism too. And here you have the face of the Lord, the body, and the warrior comes down. Like, all of this, or, or his blood, his wound heals the earth, and you have kind of the same symbolism going on as, as Mars would um, exchange matter with the earth during some of these battles in heaven or as the planets were passing over. And that's why if you look at the earth, you're going to see a lot of, or, or why would there be so much Martian material um, across large swaths of the earth? When you really look at the geology, like electric geology and stuff, you're going to see that there's a clear indication that there were some planetary encounters and likely involving uh, the resurfacing of Mars and the Earth together, like Valle Marineris or the valley, the long valley in on Mars, that wound on this warrior, right? Like the wound in the side of Christ, same type of thing. Uh, and and that wound protected us from Venus, who had gone out off track, according to the mythology and Velikovsky and things. I'm getting too much into the weeds, but explain, explaining this symbol, um, just how it's overlaid, it means a lot to me. So go for it. Well, I just say it, it was a, a good picture. So this imagery is the same root of all sacred elephant. I already mentioned this a bit, or bull arms upraised in the composition or multiple arms, planetary uh, plasma filaments, or the sacred Hamza, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let's look at some of these images. Yeah, this is like Hindu culture. You've got the same structures. Look, you got the arch, the pillars, making the same kingly gestures. These things are important. Um, and you have the tusks of the elephant. This one's kind of broken, so you don't see them as well. And the, the this would be the, the obelisk coming down, or the penis, the phallus, right, and, and the other depictions, but the nose in this one. Um, you also have him squatted or seated on a pedestal or a flower base, usually, like Buddha on the lotus. This is the pillar, the pillar of heaven, the mountain, the world mountain that the heaven man is sitting on, and above it, this would be this would be like the the same as the Illuminati eye up at the top, or Kolob at the top, the planets in the behind. Whereas you'd have like Mars and Venus doing the dance in the middle, and that's what a lot of this represents. The multiple arms and things would be the same plasma discharge of um, uh, you know like a radial discharge of stars up in heaven. That's why you have these multiple arms, or why Medusa would have a head full of snakes. Because this would be like the face, and this would be either a crown like this, or if they were, you know, going wild and um, the instabilities were a bit chaotic, it would look like dragons or snakes coming out as hair. And why would it petrify you and turn you to stone? Because it's the same type of energy and force that was used to to saltify the the or crystallize Sodom and Gomorrah in that catastrophic event and and heavenly event. So you see where these themes they reoccur, and not only do they reoccur in terms of like matching symbolism, but all across all seven continents in every major culture, they've got some iteration of these pillars, the arch, you know, the heaven above, the, the multi-armed God or faced God or whatever it is. It's just the different positions and configurations of the ancient heaven. 
They're depicting heaven on earth. It's kind of like the Ten Commandments says, you know, thou shalt not make any graven image of anything in heaven um, or under the earth or above the heaven or above the earth and kind of things. Because you start to anthropomorphize that kind of stuff like this and you begin to worship them. That's idol worship comes from this astrology, basically. A misunderstanding of cosmism is where idolatry comes from. And who does it today more than ever? Well, it's Hollywood, right? And science fiction and television and all these things that relate to this type of experience. A transfiguration event is a vision event, receiving a message, right? Now we go to television to have them tell us what heaven is like. That's, that's the sadness that I see that the mystery of Babylon has fooled everyone through fake science, through fake uh, entertainment, through fake everything, fake government. We've got uh, Gedeon and robbers full of everything and all of this ancient wisdom, the spirit of Elijah is lost on them. They have no idea. We have the keys. This is the Hamza. I'm, somebody saw a car with this and thought it was me driving <laughs> because I talk about this stuff so often. Yeah, but you can see all the same symbolism. Look at this tree going up. You have the two, you know, the two guardians, or what I would call them. I don't think it was this sticker. I think I think they thought it was you because the car also said MILF on it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I, I am. I am a missionary yeah. that I like to preach and for fun and stuff. That's what that stands for. So yeah, in the middle you have the Om. Um, which is the the noise or the voice of heaven, the word of heaven being in the middle, seated on the throne. Like all this stuff has the same, like Christ symbolism to me. I see this and I see Christ. I don't see an occult perversion and satanic uh, blah, 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 blah. No, because in their true form, this religion was was worshiping essentially the same spirit, the same God, the same idea, but they didn't have the full truth. They're depicting sacred things, you know, more clearly than you could describe if I asked you what the temple was about, right? You might be like, oh, it's a sacred experience. It's this and that. And we make covenants with the Lord. Right, great. But I'm talking about an ascension experience like these people experience in other religions, like uh, Buddhists and Nirvana and, and ascending up to heaven to the mount, right? In our doctrine, it's there, receiving your se second comforter or having visions or, you know, the gifts of the spirit. They're available to us, but are we asking? No, we're comfortable. We're comfortable because we don't need to. And maybe that's not for me. Maybe I'm not worthy. We have all these ideas in our head to cause noise when if you just go out, out sit in the wild, you might have this type of vision just becoming at one with nature and God. We're so disconnected from that by everything. Now, here's a warlike aspect of it. Again, you have the twin pillars coming down from the tusks, everything in the same uh, situation here. It's a bit more creative. You've got the twin snakes like Ouroboros forming the pillars here and the warrior with the bow shooting. This, I could find the scriptures too. I'm imagining where Christ returning is uh, the warrior on the white horse with the bow shooting arrows. Uh, this, or, or ancient Indian traditions where the highway to heaven or the stairway to heaven was not described as a stairway, but a chain of arrows right? Shot together. Boom, boom, boom. And, and that would be the same like the, the gazelle picture. Uh, I want to say it's correlated. I'm trying to, I don't think that's the right word. Cor, cor, uh, there's a architectural okay. way to describe this, this texture or picture pattern or something. Correlated. I can't remember. My mind is not pulling it at the moment, but that's what I see uh, in terms of the, the arrows. If they were, if you look like a chain of arrows going in, the, in it, I, I'm sure we could find a picture for it. I, on the spot here, I don't have it. I hope that makes sense. And somebody who knows will likely comment. This heavenly symbol was not only visible fixed in the antediluvian sky while Earth, uh, as a polar, while Earth as a polar satellite followed the original sun Saturn and fell into captivity in a new celestial star soul. But this sign of electrical horns was also visible during the age of chaos. So again, like I said, it wasn't just before the flood where these, these, you know, this giant structure was seen and Saturn was so visible. Well, after Saturn fled and Jupiter took over, and after Jupiter fled, uh, well, Mars and Venus took the main show. Like uh, Bell and the Dragon is essentially the story. Uh, well, all of these from, from uh, Joseph down to the dispersion and the, I would say, translation of the ten tribes, like the lost tribes and all those catastrophic, tr catastrophic events, even leading up to the advent of Christ with the new star in the sky and that Passover, right? I would say that's the dissipation of this ancient heavens is that it took that much time. For Venus and Mars to make terrible Passovers and terrorize everybody from the time of Jacob and Joseph down until even Jesus' day, where it was affecting things. Because on his crucifixion, it came back around, and we know by the Book of Mormon account, too, that there was a planetary catastrophe happening at the time of his crucifixion, which he timed again for the Passover, which was timed again because and in memory of these catastrophic events that had taken place in ancient Israel and by Moses' hand. Do you see the symbolism in there? I'm not making this up. Like, we, we sing it in Christmas coming up here, right? That it's a star, a star shining in the east, right? These signs are, are cosmic as well that we should be looking for. But people, no, don't want to talk about that. It was, could be construed as astrology. I don't want to be associated with those types of people. Mm, mm, mm. Not good, right? When what did, what did Abraham do 
when he had the Urim and Thummim? What was the first thing he was taught? It was astronomy, the stars, right? He was taken up to the macro to see the power and magnificence of God and to put everything into proper eternal perspective. And then he was shown every particle of the earth down to the micro, right? This is what I'm, I'm suggesting that the temple does for us. It allows us to unify these ideas, the cosmic to the micro, the macro to the micro, the outer to the inner, the heavenly to the earthly, and bring it all together in one, in one uh, conjunction. So here you have the caught arms. I mean, it, it is so obvious to me once you have the basic understanding or the general thesis behind uh, an old heaven like this, where this was fixed, immovable in the north. This didn't rise east to west like the anthropologists and Egyptologists of today are forced, forcing a square hole into a round peg. Or round, dang, I mixed it up. You get what I'm saying. A round peg, no, a square peg into a round hole, right? They're trying to force two things that don't make sense. Like LDS authors trying to force evolutionary theories by Darwin and um, uniformitarianism concepts of billions and billions of years of creation with modern doctrine and, and revelation, right? It's oil and water. They don't work because the foundation is, is corrupted. Their foundation is not taking into consideration God or the metaphysical or anything. They call it all dark matter, right? They call it all black holes. They call it all dark energy. It's always dark because they have no light. Moving on. Here you have, um, and all of these elements, they knew they represented the same thing, like this, <laughs> the ankh of life, right? It's the womb. It's the, the vesica Pisces that Christ stands in and is depicted in and on all of the throne of God pictures. If you look it up, here's the twin mountains again. And this would be a triple mountain if you're, if you're getting really good at looking at these things. This is what I'm talking about again. Again, this is the same as the hypocephalus where you have this right in the middle, this triple mountain. It's the same picture, same depiction. And here, here you have uh, lions or cheetahs or panthers and you've got their storms on them, right? They've got, they bring these swirls, the whirlwind, and they've got spots. <clears throat> I'm not sure if the spots had significance for like the meteors or asteroids or the maruts is what they were called, the satellites of Mars that as Mars would be passing over. It wasn't just Mars that we were worried with. It was his satellites too his large moons and things that would come and look like chariots of fire or that would be the cause of a lot of, you know, catastrophic events could be just passing through the tails of whatever baggage Mars is, is passing with or the tail of Venus, which was highly electric and full of um, all kinds of ionized material that would have interacted with our atmosphere and caused literal physical effects on this earth. This is from the Thunderbolts Project. A lot of these uh, black and white depictions I steal from their videos. I borrow from their videos for educational purposes. Egypt uh, artists knew that the horns of the bull and the two peaks meant the same thing. So what he's talking about, they've combined the same image, these horns of the bull and an obvious picture of a bull and these twin pillars, even though they know they represent the same thing. You get it? It's reinforcing, rehashing that these things were overlaid in the sky, seen. It was repetitive. It's a cycle. Like the, these are permanent, eternal things, and that's why they were emulated so so much in in the vestiture of the kings, uh, the pharaohs, the high court, the priests, all of these people who were privy to understand these things. The higher class, like that, the priest class of Egypt and whatnot, the sorcerers, the astrologers, they understood what this meant. And compounding these ideas only further enhances your ability to recognize meaning in them. Like and to derive what era this might have been from or what magical powers this might possess or, or grant unto somebody who is aware and actively using the energy from this type of configuration. This is where like real magic and things um, I believe are, are manifest is when you have a different electrical state even. I believe it can happen now too, just like the day of Pentecost, right? It doesn't have to be that planets are always in close proximity. We're not in close proximity now, yet everybody every day is experiencing the love of God through some type of revelation. He's speaking to us constantly and sending that light and power to us now. We're just in such a diffused state, a telestial state, that it's hard to recognize without quieting down and listening for the still small voice because there's too much noise around us. I am beating a dead horse or a dead cow calf literally here with just showing more uh, of the same depiction but in different uh, geographical areas. Uh, like this is the Egypt living raw sign here, but also the Maya power of life or power life. The same Y form or cloven shape right and when we have it in this context of pentecost we know it's a power revelatory like life giving knowledge giving light giving st uh, state of being right and that's why these are i keep saying right i'm not forcing you to agree with me but it's just sorry and then uh here you have the the wheel and twin mountains of egypt the twin peaks of aket as well as in delaware indians here on the american continent right you have the same idea with the ancient uh, homeland 
certain Indians. I can't remember which Delaware Plains Indians, right? But look at this. Does this not remind you of what do we have in our doctrine and early church lore of these people who would have known this from Joseph who taught this stuff? Uh, LDS and stone. Right? Do you not see the same twin mountains and sun in the middle here, this, this polar configuration? And what do you have up top but the sound of trumpets? and a mighty wind and rushing waters. This is the waters of the north returning as pillars, right? This right here, this depiction of the sun is not the sun you see coming up a.m. to p.m. This is the ancient sun of heaven. This is this sun. Do you see the twin mountains on the side? Do you see the same depiction? Do you see this electricity and noise and planets and all kinds of praise going on? It's the same here. The angels blowing their horns and coming back into position in congregation, in holy communion together again to, to initiate the millennium and the, and the actual state change of the earth. Okay, enough waxing on, on those. Oh, I go into it. See, I, I naturally go into these places that are just all <laughs> part of the thread anyways. This should be... In the last, go for the, it. the last 10 minutes or so, my mind will be going all over the place as far as just thinking. You, know, you see the symbols and it gives you thinking of all the different places and stories and mythology that you've seen it, right? Yeah. Or when you search it out, you're just like, wow, incredible. And this is why I believe this is the grand key. This... This is why I harp on this so much is because of how useful it is in, de in filtering and deciphering all truth cross cultures. Think of how good of a missionary or how amazing of an Ammon like missionary you could be to a modern day Lamoni, right? To say, oh, that Hamza that you believe in that you call sacred or whatever, we believe it too. We call it Kolob. Let me, let me talk to you about it. A prophet named Joseph Smith in 1830 was teaching about this in a book called The Pearl of Great Price. Like, do you understand what I like how powerful that could be to go to any culture on any continent and say the God you worship is the God who has returned and he's preparing the earth for his glorious return, right? Like that's, that's the power in this that I see for the future because it will be manipulated and used against Christianity because this has been considered by mainstream Christianity, the Gentile Christianity as occult stuff, right? That we get bagged on this for having a Kolob philosophy or any type of hint of temporal um, parallel to the spiritual gospel. Right. We, we are lambasted for our ties to the occult and Joseph and delving in magic and, and ritual magic and astrology or Freemasonry or whatever it is. When all of those disciplines and, and realities of life, they are infested with this symbolic archetypes, with this, this symbolic planetary cosmic language. And we deny it in our modern Babylonian society. That's where I believe we are just like Israel and Egypt under Pharaoh's rule, where we've got, you know, oppression in our workload, in our diet, in the killing of babies. The, this, this accompanies every great advent and every great ministering transfiguration event where you have the kings of the world up in arms by what, what, they, what their astrologers know is prophesied to come. Some change in the heavens is about to take place. There are signs in the heavens that those who are aware of these types of things will be seeing beforehand and manifesting their will on the earth before the destruction comes. I believe right now what you're experiencing with the pandemic, with global wars and rumors of wars everywhere, and the Ezra's Eagle prophecy coming to a head and all these things is a manifestation of this prelude to cosmic language, to cosmic, the heavens moving, the angels shouting, the moment of silence, the half hour of silence to end, and angels to fly with trumpets loud to shock the people. I believe we are at that point, right? And that's why I think this is important to understand and know. The more you know about this, the less you will fear it. The more you know about it, the more you will feast upon the scriptures that color in what I am not necessarily coloring, right? And, and you will test it for yourself against that rod. Go to the scriptures, go to the standard works and look for these things. Look for a way to apply them faithfully. Look for a way in the temple to see these things. Moving on. Plasma is predictable and scalable. Depending on the two bodies conducting an exchange of power, the plasma will light up in consistent patterns that reflect all of what I'm saying. Crescents, horn shapes, arm-like instabilities, ladder-like structures, and pillars or ropes, etc. Yes, and when you start looking into plasma physics, you will see all these same signs that you see in temples, cathedrals, grand halls, government buildings. They're mimicking these same types of structures in their design. It's not coincidental. Important here to note it at the top of this Birkeland current, right, where you have something at the bottom reacting to something at the top and a, an electrical connection, like an ET atom to God finger connection of, of light happening. And it's manifest. At the top, though, you have this Y shape. They call it the terminus. And at the bottom, you have a torus or around the middle sometimes. And if you imagine we're looking at a bisection of like a donut. And so you see in the middle. Or like imagine Jupiter. I have a picture of Jupiter. I had a picture of Jupiter's magnetic field. See how there's like a donut almost that goes around Jupiter? This is where his moons would go. This is kind of a bad picture, but there are lots of uh, 
fields and maybe there are donuts within donuts um, in the big picture but you can see this shape it's repetitive it's cyclical it's fractal i believe our human bodies are a manifestation of this as well and i get into that here in the thread oh let me go through these pictures um there you go plasma here's actual plasma oh that's a terrible picture i didn't realize how low quality that was a lot of these i do on my phone so i, I apologize but um you can see like a tree. It's, you can see what it is. Uh, you see the striations, et cetera. Right. And you could see if the, there was more yeah. power through this or something and it was more in a stable position, you would see two firm, more firm legs form down here at the bottom and two arms or term, uh, a Y shape more firmly at the top. It would be more uniform. They would combine like rope if, the, if there was more um, voltage or power going through it. Here you have just a normal plasma ball, but you would see that if I could zoom in on this and I can't because the image, again, quality is low. But these are filaments that twist together like rope, okay? Just like Jack and the Beanstalk, it would have been a light. You know, like all these fairy tales and fables that you hear about weird things and giants and stuff that doesn't make sense. In this kind of paradigm where you're understanding that the heavens and the earth literally have changed within the memory of man and the creation, um, and that all of our mythology and things that our modern societies discard as garbage and you know primitive people trying to make sense of their surroundings. No, no, we are in decline. They don't understand that. I harp on that a lot. All right, and then I've shown this image a lot. Different petroglyphs that um, basically uh, witness the same shape and form that these these uh, depictions are from Dr. Anthony Peratt, who works out of Los Alamos Laboratory, which is the same laboratory that produced the Manhattan Project, nuclear bombs, stuff like that. Lots of high energy, high money, high frequency types of experiments that are top secret and classified. When he came out in year 2000 or, or just around uh, 2000, and he saw the work of Anthony Talbot, who was the one collecting a lot of these um, electric universe, Saturnian mythologies and, and aggregating them. He noticed immediately that the depictions of petroglyphs and things that Talbot had collected matched exactly his, his models and what he was experiencing in the laboratory. And he was like, his first thought he described was, who let all my documents out? Like, who has my files? Who's been leaking my files? Because this is exactly what I'm seeing in the plasma laboratory. And so they got together and um, really had, they've projected the Thunderbolts project and all of the catastrophists who are in this alternative science field of plasma cosmology. Um, Anthony Peratt has been p pivotal. And you don't have to agree 100% with everything the Thunderbolts project says. I think they are the largest vehicle pushing this type of ideology, which I believe is correct. The Thunderbolts project, they're like atheists. They're, they're trying not to incorporate God into this and just try and, you know, again, a, a purely physical approach to things. What I'm suggesting is that they are the best source to find the information to filter through, to judge by a prophetic paradigm, by a Joseph Smith restored gospel, Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints paradigm, right? And you will see what is true and, and what they're presenting that might not be true, right? What, what accords with scripture and what doesn't? Um, that's how I approach these. I'm not saying everything that the Thunderbolts say is true and everything that regular science says is wrong. No, 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 no. It is obviously more nuanced than that. But on fundamental issues of... Um, these things, I, I believe the Thunderbolts and Electric Universe Plasma Cosmology people are, are more on the track and in line and in harmony with what, what prophets have taught than anybody else. Um, these are things that have actively been recreated in plasma laboratories. Okay, I'm reading the tweets now, and it's a reiteration of basically what I said again. Uh, you can most definitely be scaled up to a planetary and cosmic scale, right? So if they're creating it in a laboratory, and this is an eternal principle and we're seeing that now in our observation skills with enhanced technologies and telescopes that there are radio waves and plasma and magnetic fields and pla everywhere. Everywhere is plasma and dust and particles and matter. There is no vacuum in space. That's a, that's a myth. That is a myth, right? There is matter ever present everywhere. And there is a force connecting it all and in and through it all. We know it as the light of Christ. What I'm suggesting is the most crudest way that we could describe it in, in temporal terms right now with our English and in 2021 would be like a plasma that there is a plasma ever present that pervades everything that we can communicate with all things if we wanted to at once. Like New Age people would call it like the Akashic record, right? Or something like that. Uh, but for us, we know it's the light of Christ. And early apostles called it, and early scientists too, before Einstein, they called it the ether. There was this ever present medium that propagated light. Before the whole misconcept, I believe it's a false concept of uh, the dual particle wave um, theory of light confused a lot of that. And then they discarded ether entirely. But I believe that was a mistake, a foundational mistake. And what have they done but supplanted what, what they took out with immeasurable things and things that they haven't yet found, like black, uh, dark magic and uh, dark matter and all of these things, black holes, right? Apparently, we just barely saw the first one, but it was actually computer generated and it looked exactly like an, a plasma universe torus, okay? The thing that they call a, the first black hole found 
is exactly what plasma physicists have have uh, been arguing black holes are from the from the get-go intense concentrations or z pinches of of galactic force and energy it is not an absence or a vacuum of matter it is where matter is being bound and created and ejected and gathered and and organized it is intense um points of light and power Yet they want to reverse it and call it a black hole that sucks in and destroys. And that, that is a total satanic inversion of something divine, eternal, and cosmic in my perspective. Big tangent. Big tangent. I'm all about that. Okay, if you want to know more about plasma physics, I recommend you study. I, I've watched a lot of his like YouTube lectures and things like that. I didn't study plasma physics. I'm not a plasma physicist. I would have loved to. But the plasma stuff is something that I have added into my worldview and paradigm in like the last five to ten years. I was aware of these ideas about 10 years ago. It wasn't until about five that I dug in and started to read all these source texts for myself, like Emmanuel Velikovsky's work, uh, Anthony Larson, and these types of things. I really started to incorporate them about that time. So again, I'm just a beginner in learning these things as well. And a, a lot of this is a cry for help. I need people who are smarter and who have the energy and time and investment to, to search some of these things and start pulling into the gospel, to the restored gospel, these truths, and helping us understand things even more clearly. So this scattering of planets was described by Job after the flood. The planets made close passovers to Earth and interacted electrically through the plasma connecting the bodies, making bright displays that are captured in art and mythology and in monuments around the world. And I've read this scripture a million times to people. I'll read it again. Job, Job 26, verse 7. He's talking about cosmic things and a catastrophe happening. And he says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and he hangeth the earth upon nothing. Well, he can't stretch out the north if the north wasn't there and close to begin with. Otherwise, why are you stretching it? And why is the earth hanging on something? when we don't see that it's hanging on anything now, but all the mythologies and all the people talking about the first sun, the ancient sun, the first sun, the paradisical sun, Atum or Saturn or Adam, right? When all this stuff was in, in, in the sky, well, the earth was hanging upon it. It was the footstool. It was the bottom of it. That's why there's the language about the earth being the footstool. And I went over this in my Daniel 7 thread a bit. So it, this should start to tie into that concept a bit. I also have another thread that I will be doing another long video like this on um, about the entire chapter of Amos 7. A series of visions he has that also describes these same type of planet, uh, uh, a cloven tongue type experience uh, or a pillar of fire type experience, a planetary version of it at the second coming when the Lord's plumb line is dropped on the earth. Ooh, that, that plays right into Ezra's Eagle, a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about. And uh, when the earth and especially the American continent will be renewed into a paradisical state um, preceding the second coming. Okay, so yeah, go to Job 26, read it. All this language is cosmic. I've gone over it in some other videos. Uh, so that I'll leave it there. So back to the cloven tongues of fire. I spend time speaking of the cosmic version because it is scalable. All of it's scalable. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit at Pentecost was the descending of pillars of fire. And here I interject what I, how I would imagine it, that they're an excitation of aether or ether or plasma tubes. So you have the Holy Spirit and here it's depicted in the art that you have these like beams of light that come down or like Moroni left up in a conduit and disappeared out of Joseph's room. This could be described as a conduit or a long rope, a cord, a power cord, right? I'm calling it an excitation of ether or that ever-present spirit, light of Christ, is excited and filled with more power directly to you like a laser beam, bing, filling you with light. This plasma, this idea of plasma ropes being connected to a source is also what they're starting to, des to describe in um, popular science. So here's, you know, straight from, well, this is a, a math and science journal. But they're observing, uh, this is in 2016, magnetic ropes is what they're calling them. Plasma filaments, right, is what I would call them. Observed for the first time between Saturn and the sun. Saturn's poles are connected to the sun by plasma filaments. If Saturn's poles are, everybody else's poles are. Our poles are. That's why the northern lights are. That's why when solar storms happen, you have the, the aurora borealis and aurora australialis on both north and south poles where this these filaments are feeding the Earth's electrical power. This this runs the climate. It is not anthropogenic, anthropomorphic, whatever, anthropogenic uh, climate change, uh, cow farts and your, your big trucks and all that, the carbon emissions. That is not what drives the, the atmosphere and climate. It is the sun primarily. Yes, we have a duty and um, a stewardship over the Earth, to do it well and to not be gross and pollute the oceans and the forests and and to abuse our resources. I, absolutely, I'm on board with all of that. But do not tell me that our, our planet is disconnected from what happens on the sun. The sun is the parent feeding everything that happens on this life. Without the sun, the earth stops. The earth is, is chased like a chased row from its position. 
That's exactly what happens at the second coming when the sun hides its face, right? And the moon turns to blood and the stars fall from heaven. The earth is removed from its place, okay? So without the sun, we're nothing. Our climate doesn't matter. It'll change drastically as the second coming happens and as the paradisical earth is restored as well. So climate change, yeah, I believe in it, but I don't believe it's caused by us like they want you to believe. They want to do that so they can guilt all the companies into paying taxes and extort more money from them like slaves they are. So here you have it on a planetary scale, these ether tubes or plasma tubes connecting the source, the sun, to the uh, you know child or satellite. Here you have the source or the sun, the Holy Ghost, the, the Jesus Christ, connecting to his disciples, to his apostles, to his satellites who are out there doing his work, hosting his glory, okay? The temples uh, that he's filling with his same light. So my opinion is that the heart of the body acts as the central anode, creating the torus or magnetic field or aura as the divine light, uh, while the divine light descending bridges the gap. So you have it connecting to your pure heart. Hence why the terminus or the top area where you'd have flaming horns or cloven horns like uh, Moses is depicted in, right? Or a halo, or uh, like I have here, a light bulb above your head. Why do we do that? Why do we depict a revelation or a bright idea as this light coming above our head? And it's depicted the same way in all the mythology and our scriptures because it's a real, true, eternal principle and it's inherent. Our bodies and our souls love it. It's a, it's a delicious doctrine. While the divine light descending bridges the gap, hence why the terminus would be visible above the head, around the head of an individual receiving strong revelation. Just like we read at the beginning with Joseph Smith looking strong like a lion and glowing right? Or all the other accounts we've read. So here's some supporting quotes I drummed up from things studying last week that are pertinent. And this video is going on pretty long, but um, I think we're almost done. Actually, every time I say that, we go on for like another hour. So I'm going to stop saying that. (laughs) All right. uh, Here are some supporting quotes I drummed up from things I was studying last week that are pertinent. Also, as another side tangent, consider watching this lecture on the body electric and why the face shows uh, most light uh, least flesh blood. Okay, so this is an Anthony Lars lecture, I'm sure, uh, where he goes in and is talking about that the face is. Wait, wait, wait. Well, hello. Skip ahead. The face is. And electricity always does. Yeah, uh, and science just turns a blind eye to the to the. All right, same old guy. Oh, never mind. I won't find it. But watch this video. It's it's ent- entirely pertinent to everything we're talking about here. Now, they don't touch on the exact same things that we, we're touching on here or that I have personally found or whatever, but he's got some also cool pieces to the puzzle that will enhance your understanding of this, okay? And look past his attitude. Look past my attitude, right? If you don't like the way I'm delivering this, I'm sorry. I, I'm trying my best. And the same thing with Anthony Larson. Imagine he wrote these books about this kind of stuff back in the 80s. They were, de- they were at Deseret Book. They were bestsellers until you know they were de-shelved is, is how he described it, is that the, the face of the books were no longer showed out to the public, like how they were displayed. It mattered because the sales dropped when the covers of the book weren't shown because nobody cares. Another book about prophecy, who cares? But the covers of his book show planets and all kinds of these concepts with plasma and Saturn and things, and that was intriguing, and it brought people's attention to you know what he was doing. But so, yeah, he had this stuff in the 80s, and people just laugh at him, and, oh, you're blah, blah, blah. Who are you? You're not a prophet. Why are you revealing something new? Blah, 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 blah. But all he was doing was pointing to, why aren't we looking around? Because he's he's not revealing anything new. He's What he did was pull together ideas and philosophies and things that were being taught outside of the church that seemed to harmonize with the scriptures, and Joseph Smith especially, and the weird esoteric things that he taught, and the things that modern scholars want to look a blind eye to. Or pretend they don't exist, like his ritual magic stuff. Or if they do now, they're doing a better job of exploring it and really diving into it and pulling out the documents and doing an objective look at it. But in the past, it was like taboo. You couldn't touch this stuff. You didn't want to speak about uh, Joseph Smith's seer stones or whatever it is. But in this kind of context, it is absolutely normal. And in 2021, it should be even more normal when everybody runs around with a silicon in their hand lighting up as a phone. Your glass, you know, your, your LED screen is a, an electric diode. It's a crystal that's having electricity run through it. A stone in a hat. Put your phone in your hat. You're Joseph Smith, right? No, you're not because Google's evil. And Google is going to tell you the wrong things. <laughs> All right. Right. <laughs> Big Anthony Larson tangent. But I think that's the video I, I'm suggesting you watch because, again, like I said, it's, it's another hour talking about these same types of concepts with other scriptures and other things that I maybe have not included. I don't know. It's been a while since I watched that. But here's some of these quotes. Before I read those, I'm going to get a drink of water. you have anything to say, Ryan? Uh, no, I'm good. Well, I've, I've got a lot to say, but I, I think we're going long enough as it is. So I'm yeah. saving my stuff till the next time. Take some notes. Finish the thread, and then that's right. I'm kind of writing down things I want to talk about. and then We're fading. All right. <laughs> Need energy. Yeah. 
here's from Saints. Uh, the new, you know, church history volumes and things. Volume two, chapter 37. I have, a, I have a whole collection of different documents I've found and I'm ready. So, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. We've got ammo and we will be shooting it hardcore at you guys with the videos in the future. Okay. So the following week, Apostle Lorenzo Snow presided at the Manti Temple's public dedication. Before the first session began, many saints in the temple's assembly hall heard angelic voices singing throughout the room. So here we have a noise. And another at, at other times, saints saw halos or bright manifestations of light around speakers. Here you have again, same type of revelation, transfiguration experience and being witnessed by many people. Literally, some people reported seeing Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor and other personages while Lorenzo read the dedicatory prayer. Someone in the congregation heard a voice say, Hallelujah, hallelujah, the Lord be praised. For the saints, these spiritual manifestations were signs of God's watchful care. They comfort the people, wrote one witness to the outpourings, being in evidence that in the most cloudy times, the Lord is with them. I think this is amazing. And again, with this concept of somebody who's manifesting light around a speaker, well, it would normally be because there's a, a being transmitting through them or transfiguring them. They're like a messenger who's receiving, they're receiving the, the message they're delivering you to, you uh, it would probably be from one of these people. So it would make sense that those hearing the message might actually even see the person, see Brigham Young or John Taylor speaking through it. What if it was, you know, behind Rasta Snow or whoever was talking, it was Brother Young, you know what I mean? Or President Young. I like to think, and that's where my mind goes with this type of uh, story. Here's another one. Like early saints, we can treasure up the words of Joseph Smith taught and live the principles he taught. Emmeline B. Wells said this, in the, prophet Joseph, uh, in the prophet Joseph Smith, I believed and I recognized the great spiritual power that brought joy and comfort to the saints. The power of God rested upon him to such a degree that on many occasions he seemed transfigured. There's that word again. His expression was mild and almost childlike in repose. And when addressing the people who loved him, it seemed to adoration. The glory of his countenance was beyond description. Again, these are the buzzwords that I told you at the beginning to look out for. At other times, the great power of his manner, more than of his voice, which was sublimely eloquent to me, seemed to shake the place on which we stood and penetrate the inmost soul of his hearers. And I am sure that, they, that then they would have laid down their lives to defend him. I always listened spellbound to his every utterance, the chosen of God in this last dispensation. This brings to my memory as well the concept that we talk about certain characters as having a magnetic personality or, well, they just command the attention of the room when they walk in. They've got a light about them. You hear this said all the time about people. I believe you can take that in a literal sense, that people with strong um, light of Christ would be felt by others seeking the same frequency, seeking the same noise. They will recognize and it will reverberate and it will shake their inmost soul of the hearer, right? I believe that. I believe that's what you're you're witnessing. And some people have that charisma, right? We call it charisma, I think. Um, but they abuse it. They don't use it for the glorification of God, but for the glorification of themselves or from others' selfish means. That's where you can have that same type of power, that mag that that projection of your inner feelings, um, but be abused, yet still it's there. It's it's real. It's not that it it, it has to only exist in, in in one situation. Now I'm I'm convoluting it, but I hope the point's there. Wilford Woodruff reported uh, reporting an April 6, 1837 sermon. He said, President Joseph Smith Jr. arose and addressed the congregation for the term of three hours, clothed with the power, spirit, and image of God. He unbosomed his mind and feelings in the house of friends. Again, I pay attention to unbosomed because that's the heart. So if he's, you see, if he's in this revelatory transfigured state where the heart is acting as the anode and above his head, they're seeing the terminus or the halo around him or the glow around him, right? Well, he's unbosoming his mind and feelings. So he's, he's connecting his revela revelatory connection and showing it, his heart and mind connected, showing everybody. Uh, he presented many things of vast importance to the minds of the elders of Israel. Oh, that they might be written upon our hearts. Man, mind, heart. Again, you see it's repeated. As with an iron pen, iron, word of God, iron rod to remain forever that we might practice them in our lives. See Job, okay, and more reference to Job. That fountain of light, man, again, a very visual language that Wilfred, a prophet, is using. Wilfred Woodruff, President Wilfred Woodruff, he's using the same fountain um, because the polar configuration, the mountain of the Lord, that's also the fount of, uh, what's that song? 
Oh, thou fount of, I don't know the words, but that, that comes to my mind when you're thinking the fountain of light. They're talking about the same throne of God structure that will bathe the earth in light and glory and bring it to a, you know, a higher state. That's the fountain of life. That's the fountain of youth. Okay, that fountain of light, that principle and virtue that came forth out of the heart and mouth of the prophet Joseph, whose soul like Enoch swelled wide as eternity, I say, such evidence is presented in such a forcible manner ought to drive into oblivion every particle of unbelief and dubiety from the mind of the hearers. So doubt. For such language, sentiment, principle, and spirit cannot flow from darkness. Joseph Smith Jr. is a prophet of God raised up for the deliverance of Israel as true as my heart now burns within me. Again, how many times did he mention heart in, in, in this idea of revelation and transfiguration? Moving on. Marianne Stearns Winters, a stepdaughter of Elder Parley P. Pratt. I stood close by the prophet when he was preaching to the Indians in the grove by the temple. The Holy Spirit lighted up his countenance till it glowed like a halo around him, and his words penetrated the hearts of all who heard him. I saw the dead bodies of Brother Joseph and Hiram as they lay in the mansion house after they were brought from Carthage, and also saw some of the clothing they had worn, tinged with their life's blood. I know they were men of God, prophet and patriarch, true and faithful. May we be worthy to meet them in the world to come. And these are just more supporting anecdotal evidence from church history and the saints, books that are being put out by the church right now. And in fact, I would bring in the accounts of the first vision that are in the saints book. I love them, especially Parley P. Pratt's version that they kind of highlight where he, he in, in that version, he mentions that as the pillar of fire descended uh, above him, he thought the very forest around him would be consumed by the flames that he saw. Okay. Another plasma conduit type phenomena where you have this excitation of plasma ether tubes <laughs> coming down and a portal manifested where heavenly beings travel down and transfigure someone to deliver a message. Now, I promised the flux capacitor. Secret combinations are real. For members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to deny or express apathy to their pervasive stranglehold on everything humanly consumed is willful ignorance in this age of information. I say that strongly, and I say that a lot, and I get a lot of flack for that from, from even from good saints. And I apologize if I come off a bit too strong sometimes. But we are in that awful situation that the Book of Mormon warns explicitly about. Now, in our popular entertainment, these holy concepts are flaunted in our face while we misunderstand them. And while they show us the plans of evil control and slavery that they are enacting upon us. But they do it in these classic movies that we all herald as you know gems and, and classics and amazing but they've been brainwashing us with their plans and we, we, we slowly consent to them by our agreement to indulge and consume their tainted, their tainted food sacrificed to idols. That being said, there is so much truth mingled with scripture in Hollywood and often the occult combinations of the devil flaunt their plans, their knowledge and our ignorance right out in the open in our most favorite and revered films. Consider the flux capacitor. This is the the whole reason that the movie Back to the Future works, where we have, I'm, I'm circling back to Morty and the fl flux capacitor. Marty and then the flux capacitor. This, this right here, this uh, discovery of Doc is what allows him to penetrate and, and create a portal through time, right? To break the temporal bounds of the earth and be transfigured uh, to another time and place kind of thing. So Back to the Future. What does the DeLorean require to travel back in time? Using the cloven tongue and caw of this electrical capacitor? Well, yes. These are the caw arms, right? The upraised arms, the cloven hooves. And here you have um, what caused it to work when um, they ran out of juice. They needed to charge the car. Wow, look at the symbolism here where you have the, the Masonic twin pillars, or you know, here's the quadrupillars, uh, but you have the pillar structure with the apex or the alpha and the omega here. You've got Saturn or Cronus, Father Time, at the top of clock towers. That's, this is the symbolism behind it the starting and ending of time the alpha and the omega this is all that symbolism and a lightning bolt coming down down a wire down a cord down an iron rod to to fuel the power and transport the the delorean to a different time and place so maybe that's a stretch maybe you're like oh leland's crazy and he's trying to fall down okay whatever but there's a lot uh, more dark occult stuff and i encourage you to watch the video i've got here i'm surprised they haven't taken it down from youtube but this movie was released 10 years prior to 9-11, right? And you had a lot of symbolism in this movie about New World Order, the Illuminati, all kinds of stuff. Um, if I just scrub through this just a little bit, you can Warning see... Warning about it. Oh, just listen right here. A group of Muslims... Listen. 
Please take whatever precautions are necessary to prevent this terrible disaster. In the 1985 classic Back to the Future, at a scene called the Twin Pines Mall. So they're already, I'm, my cosmic mind is already thinking of the twin tablets, the twin towers, the cloven hooves. They've already got the two pillar symbolism, the Yachin Boaz going. That's what the twin towers were. When you look in who they were built by, they were built by these same money baron, robber barons that are manipulating the money, the money system and controlling the governments now. Those twin towers were built for a ritual purpose. I am saying that boldly and I don't care what you think of me. You are ignorant if you think that all these things and wars and things that have been thrust upon us are a coincidence theory. No, it is a conspiracy theory of history. And the Gadiant and robbers of modern time that the Book of Mormon warns against are here. They're alive. They're real. And we are in an awful situation. And here we eat it up. We eat up what they tell us. We will bear witness to a sudden surprise terrorist attack perpetrated by a group of Muslim terrorists. The attack is at the Twin, which is a reference to the Twin Towers. If you pause that too, it's 9 11 mm -hmm. upside down as well, right? The 9 11 right here. Yeah, in, in all the yeah. numbers <laughs> that you see in this, they're predicting the date too. You got 9 11. At the end too, I'll show it when um, when Marty goes back to say the that. future. Yeah, I'll save it for the end. But check this Turn out. the sign upside down. The digits on the okay, clock it, read yeah. 9 1 1 or 9 11. You were already seeing it. See, we've been on this track this whole this whole video and thread where we're thinking exactly what's coming next. But the Twin have. Pines are a symbolic representation of the Twin Towers. Before the terrorist attack, the Twins are present. But after the attack, the Twins are gone, replaced with a single pine. This takes place on 9-11, where the Twins are destroyed and replaced with a single tower, the One World Trade Building. Okay. That's that's crazy just in itself. Take that. It goes on. There's there's much more. Like um, at the point where there's the the lady's telling him to save the clock tower, uh, right here. Save the clock. Now look. Uh, oh, they'll point it. Out. Don't forget to take a flyer. Save the clock tower. In a story we already suspect of being a 9/11 warning, how is it possible that this phrase appears on a flyer telling the future? Then, when the tower strike takes place, a giant flaming 9-11 is ignited in the street. And here you have all oh, you can't this the, the color, but you have a nine here and then the eleven down here. That's what they're showing. Marty knows exactly when and where this tower strike will happen because it's all written on this flyer and placed in his hands. But something lurks in the background overseeing this transaction. And there you have the distortion of these holy things, this Illuminati, this, the New World Order behind the scenes. Yeah, maybe it's a gimmick and maybe, you know, the uh, maybe it wasn't all as intentional as this video or I am trying to portray it out to be. But I'm saying in reality, behind the scenes, it is because there's only two churches. They're saved, but two churches going on right now. So this indoctrination or scripture that they're putting out, this television that they want to put out as their doctrine, it is incorporating all the same heavenly symbols, but inverting the meanings towards their their desire for a one world order or a, a, a Babylon to rival Jesus Christ's Zion of the millennium, where you are having the emergence of two world powers, two world governments, two world religions. It'll be Zion versus Babylon. It'll be Christ versus the Antichrist. And this is all leading up to it. You can poo-poo this all you want, right? And I would recommend you can watch the rest of the video. They've got even more junk and stuff. Um, go to Heyday. But, but again, with discernment and all this stuff, because there, there's some parts in here where I'm like, eh, that's a stretch. You know what I mean? That's okay. But some of these things are undeniable in terms of the repetition of 9-11 in the video and in the movie, the dates, um, even G George Bush Sr. Uh, 10 years before is talking about a new world order they're about to usher into, and they will do it. All these videos are, are you know, public access and we have had access to them, we just decide, oh, no way, everything is great, all is well in Zion, and we're not taking the, the cues and the hints to be looking at everything through this prophetic, cosmic, uh, and gospel paradigm. The more similarities, too, I'm not sure if I want to mention this next time or, or how much I want to tangent here, but I'm thinking about the, the cloven hooves, right, or the cloven tongues, uh, the, 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 the twin peaks, right, the, the twin towers with the Saturnian sun in between, mm -hmm. right? So you have the, the two columns, you have the black sun in between. And if you look at this, essentially make like a one zero one, right? Yeah. And so this is something that you see all over the media, right? So for example, in Twin Peaks, there's an entrance of Black Lodge, a place that exists in their dimension. That's like a rabbit hole between two trees and that you have it, the one zero one, right? Where you have the, the two trees in the rabbit hole. I'm going to see if I can send you a picture. I'm not sure if you can put it up very yeah, easily. Put it in the chat, I can pull it up. <clears throat> Let's see. So there's a picture of, of Twin Peaks <clears throat> showing it, right? 
Another example is in George Orwell's novel, 1984, right? Room 101 is a place where people's worst fears come true. Or in The Matrix, Neo's apartment number is also room 101, right? Right. Where, One you know, once again, you, you have the whole idea is that the two pillars and then, then the Saturnian sun in between it, right? Yes. Or, or like um, Maya Calendar Throne. Must be spelled Calendar Orwell. I know I've shown this picture in another video I made. Let me find uh, where it has. It used to actually be a statue in between the Twin Towers that uh, it's in that picture as well. That you it kind of looked like the 101 again. Oh, yeah. With the, the black sun and then the, the two towers on the side of it. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Copy link. Hold on. Technical difficulties. There it is. Yeah, we have the two towers and then the, is it black? Um, I'm curious, or is it silver or reflective? Yeah. I wonder yeah, what the, so. the actual color is. I didn't know this. This is new to me, so that's cool, <clears throat> the 101. But you're right, in terms of the Saturnian symbolism, in its most generic form, it would look like this. Two pillars, uh, a circle ascending, which would form the arch. That's what an arch is when you're looking at the symbolism. It's the ascension of the morning star, right? Or this planetary configuration that we would have seen uh, stretch out in the north, and then stretch out and be gone and, and separate. And these twin pillars, Samson's pillars that he's holding up, right? Atlas's pillars of the earth. These, this, this ancient pillar God was dissolved. The old heavens and the old earth were left. And that paradisical golden age was lost. These occult, oh, I almost said a bad word. These occult, <laughs> these occult <laughs> robber barons, these, this mystery Babylon, <laughs> these, uh, th these bad guys, right? The secret combinations of our day um, they're flaunting this. They, they know that this is what this was, that the true history was that the heavens and the earth were different, but they are pretending to create their own millennium, their own golden age by enslaving the sheep class, you and I, regular people, the Christians, anybody that believes in any type of religion, right? And those who don't bow to Satan and uh, they will have their millennium, their kingship off of our backs, that's the way that they say that they, uh, they will use our agency to further their goals, just like Satan from the beginning. It was to take away the agency of man for his own glorification and benefit. He wanted the glory and the power for redeeming everyone. And that's exactly the same idea that th this group, this occult group, is using with communism. Communism is a vessel to institute this type of religion and philosophy. An atheistic, um, it seems like Zion, it seems like the holy order and the things that we know that the Lord has revealed for the millennium or that he revealed you know, in times past, but it's an inversion in that they're not using... Um, they're not relying on God's providing their promised land. They're taking it from those who they shouldn't be. They're doing it all on their own without God. That's, that's the inversion of it. Long story short, bad guys. All right, let's get back to the thread. I'm getting kind of burnt out, but let's finish it up strong. Um, I do go into, and this is an, again, I'm not an electrical engineer. I, uh, wish I had studied that, but somebody who does know more, I would love for you to go into, uh, this this idea, I say here, I'm sure someone who knows more about electrical engineering would be able to go into greater depth about the Y delta and its importance in electrical circuits. The celestial kingdom is a network or a circuit of glorified family. That statement to me is more profound than I, I gave it credence for right now. Like I've thought about this a lot and I, this comes back to me all the time that our new name and our, our white stone, which turns into a Urim Thummim, our glorified bodies, which dictate where physically we can go, right? Somebody who has a terrestrial body can't go up to a celestial world. Somebody in the celestial world can't go up into a celestial world, right? But the celestial one can come down certain degrees, but not all the way. There's there's some type of power gradient that's that's given in resurrected bodies. And the celestial kingdom, I believe, is like the the overarching network, the the main organizing force in all existence in eternity. And that we get invited in to participate with that, by, like being connected into an internet of sense. Like the internet would be a bastardization or a, a worldly temporal version of that same idea. That the one-mindedness of Zion, that one heart, desire, and, and mindset is being connected into a network of celestial power, basically. Um, I'm not going to go through into these things, but again, for somebody who's into electrical engineering or could maybe expand on this more, I just see, yeah, I'm recognizing these Im these images as being relevant in terms of the Trinity, the power of three, the uh, Y and Delta. All, all these things are also visibly 
there in these larger plasma manifestations of what I'm talking about. That it's the same shape and form, and we we, we usually utilize it obviously at this you know electrical circuitry level as well. Even the way we transmit power and stuff in fiber optics or cords or metals, it's it's a braided type of uh, metal, right? That's wound into like a rope. That's the same as we see with the Birkeland currents of plasma and things. That's how plasma organizes itself is in Birkeland currents or ropes, positive and negatively charged that wrap around each other. Okay, um, another topic for another day that is intimate, and I think I mentioned this earlier, which is good, intimately related, is anointing the head and feet with consecrated oil and the importance of that in this more temporal, like literal layer of the gospel um, and what it has to do. Like the, the, the waters rising up to the north um, during the second coming events or that plasma stream when the rod of iron was connected to the earth and that the tree of life was, still, was there, when, when the, the world tree was present and this ancient structure of planets was visible, that it would have looked like oil pouring down on Earth's head. Go up and look, watch the northern lights, right? And you, you see them. It looks like oil moving around on the top. And if you were looking at a distance and you saw the, the northern lights moving on the top of the Earth, it would look like he was anointed on the head with some oil or something, right? Some shiny oil. Um, I think there's more to that than we give uh, thought to in, in the latter days. I think it, it's beautiful. It, it has room to expand and have so many other layers of application. Okay. I know that Jesus lives... He now possesses a resurrected body of flesh and bones that is powered by spirit fluid or plasma or light and on a level of power spectrum deemed celestial and godly. We too can partake of that glory if we but follow him and make and keep covenants with him. That's the whole gospel of Jesus Christ is how to return to become like him. We were meant to be in the stars. We were, we were meant to return to the stars. We were meant to return to him, to our father in heaven with our brothers and sisters of light who chose these things. That's my testimony. I know that, um, I did want to mention, just because this happened after I had put this all together, where this video was posted. I'm sorry to have this profanity up on the screen for so long. I'm sorry, guys. But uh, <laughs> but I retweeted this because look at, look at what it's showing. It's Jupiter in infrared. And you get to see clearly these magnetic uh, wings, right? Or this, this plasma that's feeding in through the poles and is out like the wings around it. And this shape, you see the Y delta almost forming at the top uh, of the planet. Uh, you see the same structures. This, to me, draws so much similarity to what I see in Ezekiel 1. What I see in, uh, let me see if I have it. What I see in Doctrine and Covenants 88, where it talks about here literally, the earth rolls upon her wings, and the sun giveth his light by day, and the moon giveth her light by night. And the stars also give their light as they roll upon their wings in glory in the midst of the power of God. So again, if we're talking a temporal, literal manifestation of the power of God, here you look, it looks like this planet and, or star, right? Failed star, Jupiter, is rolling in its wings in the glory and power and countenance of God. Like if, if this were to be more powerful, we would see it from Earth and it would light up and glow and be a new star. Like it would shine up and shine and be bright in the sky and probably would affect us, to be honest, right? So look at this form and then look at the characters that are associated with Ezekiel 1, with this type of language, um, I'm going to get back to that. But the characters I'm talking about are these. You have seraphs where they have wings, two twain down and two up and, and, and two, two, two to the side and a halo around them, the transfiguration type event, right? And why do they have eyes on the wings? What do these things symbolically represent? We don't have to guess. We know in Doctrine and Covenants, I think it's sec section uh, 77, where Joseph Smith is revealing and asking questions about the book of Revelation. And he asks, what do the wings and the eyes represent? And they said, well, the wings basically are for increased mobility that angels and other beings and things have. And the eyes are light and knowledge and wisdom. Why would you put the light on the thing transporting them, right? Unless it had something to do with what we're seeing here. And what we're seeing here, Right? where you have light manifest during transfiguration events where people can move and go in places, or Moroni, who went up through a conduit surrounded by this light, and it probably made certain patterns that might have looked like this or like wings, right? All of these things, they remind me of uh, what we're talking about here, that you would see these things in planets in the sky. You would see them in beings. You would, they would look like they might have wings if they were coming down in that same kind of glory and power, although they don't. Joseph Smith taught that angels don't have wings, but it's okay to draw them with wings like this, like St. Michael, because here you have the Twin Peaks. It's the same symbolism. You have the triple mountain of him standing, and here's the Twin Peaks double time. Here he's standing between them, and he's got the pillar, right? It's all there. This is why this is fine to me. This is perfect. This is in form. 
Even though, yeah, literally angels don't have wings, bro. Okay, great. Yeah, but do you understand the symbolism, what they mean, what, what it represents, flaming sword, all, any of this stuff, the shield of, of, of righteousness, his shoes are shod, like he's wearing the, the armor of God, which is also a depiction of the true heaven man, not the Bebel, Babylonian markup that gets destroyed by the rock cut forth without hands, which is the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is the priesthood of Melchizedek, which has been restored through Joseph Smith by heavenly ministers and angels through this power of transfiguration that we're talking about. Right? How many witnesses have we read that saw Joseph Smith enveloped in this glory and power and his countenance physically changed? These are the things I'm talking about. This is what excites me. This is what I wish we could be talking about day in and day out instead of criticizing each other for misinterpretations of the basic fundamental knowledge of the plan of salvation. This is what we're missing out on. Okay. I think I just burnt the last fuse there and had a stroke. Oh, I said I'd get back to this. Are you understanding is what I said. This is uh, ancient Zoroastrian... Um, Anunnaki type stuff. Stitchin and the crazy people, the David Ikes of the world would tell you that it was aliens who came and seeded the earth and messed with the genetics and blah, blah, blah. Well, they're half right, right? You would call a ministering angel or an angel coming down or anybody coming down, a heavenly being, you would call them an alien. They're extraterrestrial, quite literally. They are not part of this terrestrial plane. And in fact, we know by Doctrine and Covenants section 132 this week and come follow me that angels do not reside on this planet. They are extraterrestrial. They reside on a globe like a sea of glass and flame, right? Like this is what we're depicting. And why does it have wings? Why would this thing representing Jupiter, this is what this was, a, a representation of Jupiter, why would it have a ring and, and wings and thunderbolts and all these other depictions? Here he's standing on the bull, he's killing the bull, he's holding the sprig of life, the acacia branch, regenerating ever, the, the life, this is, this is eternal life, the paradise lost. Um, but this would have been after the like of Jupiter, not quite Saturn, because this is the era of Abraham and uh, post-Noah, which would have involved more Jupiter worship. That's what I get here. Um, okay, but before I get to the Zedek, this is an Egyptian depiction of the same winged planet. So these wings, I'm saying, are depicted in uh, what we would see literally in infrared here with Jupiter. All right, moving down. This video, I recommend you watch it. Uh, my buddy Electric Universe Eyes put it up. Zedek. The but it goes into the definition of Zedek and how it relates to Jupiter, if you didn't know that. Yeah, in fact, all the ancient rites and rituals say that uh, Melchizedek, was a Jupiter death cult, right? The cult of Jupiter was prominent in the Salem of the high priest Melchizedek. Melchizedek, quote, priest of the most high, was, it follows, a worshiper of Jupiter. This was... All right, Th that was, he's reading basically something from Emmanuel Velikovsky, who was writing on the name of Zedek. Zedek is my king. And, and if you have the Melchizedek priesthood, you better know that this is what these ancient tie-ins are. And how would you explain that, right? Without this cosmic picture, without understanding that the first son was Saturn, and then Jupiter dethroned him and took it over and was king for a while until Sodom and Gomorrah and all these other uh, happenings, and then the Passovers of Mars and Venus took over, right? Like, if you didn't know that there was this shifting and changing of the literal heavens— you would never make sense of why they would say that that Melchizedek is part of a Jupiter cult, right? Why would you say that? And and oh, I could go on, but I've already gone on for too long. I'm sorry. <laughs> Piggybacking right on this. This is right the same time as the Tower of Babel. Um, and consider the confusion of languages as an electric phenomenon caused by planetary catastrophe, residual planetary movement after the flood, likely caused by Jupiter. And again, Velikovsky writes about this, the confusion of languages and the incidents at the Tower of Babel, the scattering and dividing of languages and people uh, being a cosmic event caused by Jupiter leaving the scene, throwing a thunderbolt, Zeus, basically, right? He's the one that's leaving the scene and causing the destruction at the Tower of Babel, the time of the Jaredites leaving and the, the, the seas heaving their bounds. That's why they built those submarine type ships and they were cast about in the waves and everything was going on. I believe they were in the residual effects of a, a planetary catastrophe of some scale right? Not quite like Saturn in the flood, but oh, a subsequent one. Um, and they, these would be the, the changing of the earth in Indian lore and mythology and their creation stories where they say we're in the fifth earth or the fifth version of the earth. Well, they're counting all these different catastrophes where the literal sun changed from one planet to the next until right now, all we know and, and, and can project on the past and the future is the current solar situation we have a bazillion years in the making. Blah, blah, we've been here for so many billions of years. We're so lucky. We're so lucky. So lucky. Beautiful. On that note, this is my thread tying in Jupiter and some of these re recent things uh, to the cloven tongues thread, the planetary scale down to the, the micro scale as above, so below. Hope you guys enjoyed this. I know it was long winded and good. I hope you get some benefit from it. More than anything, I hope your testimony in Jesus Christ grows and in the restored gospel. Get to the temple, read the scriptures, test the standard works with these things that you've heard from, from me today, from Ryan today, um, that you will hear in the future. And I promise that 
the spirit will work on you. Maybe the things, maybe all of the things I've said here are not exactly perfect and true. And I apologize. I'm not perfect. But I know that in my efforts to understand these things, I have drawn closer to Christ. My determination to study the gospel has grown and increased exponentially. And I am enjoying the temple and the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Pearl of Great Price, any of these passages that before I was bored to read, like Isaiah or uh, Jeremiah or Lamentations, like all these things are opened anew with this layer of cosmism. Ryan, any final thoughts from you? There is so much in the Doctrine and Covenants that I absolutely love. I love DNC so much, but I'm also very excited to start Old Testament. Come follow me next year. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of things, a lot of foundations we've talked about that we'll keep talking about that we'll build upon later. And next year's going to be awesome. This year's also awesome. Like I said, I love DNC, but it's, it's going to be good. Yes. And, and DNC, like right now, this is my favorite section in 132 that talks about the white stone, that talks about planets, that talks about uh, the, 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 the connection between our white stone and the celestialized earth and how we are of the dust of the earth. And all of these things that you've heard us talk about today, especially the more doctrinally ones, uh, the more doctrinally esoteric ones that maybe you cocked an eyebrow at, like that we, there will be no blood in the resurrection. Um, if you continue to follow us here on YouTube and my threads, I'm going through and kind of doing a play-by-play of Doctrines of Salvation by Joseph uh, Fielding Smith, compiled by Bruce R. McConkie, you know, 1950s era type, type doctrine um, commentary. But they explicitly go into this about there being no blood in a resurrected body and um, cite that stuff. So we'll definitely be revisiting these topics. It's all interconnected and intermingled in this bigger story. So hope you've appreciated it and enjoyed it, and we'll see you later.